afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Sabbath again. I guess all of us have eaten and we're ready for the next session. So I'm asking everyone to come in. Please come in and have a seat so we can begin. Young people in the hall, please come in so we may begin. Kayla, can you close the doors, please? Thank you. How many of you enjoy the morning session? I, that's a weak amen. 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 Right. So we want to start this afternoon. we right on time. Let's turn to hymn number 327. And based on what we heard, we have to make a decision. So we'll sing, I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. Number 327, we'll sing one song and give Pastor Spencer the rest of the time. One verse, I'm sorry, not the song, but one verse. 327. Yes, 327. Here we go. I'd rather have Jesus the silver or gold. I'd rather be his than a bridge is untold. I'd rather have Jesus than hearts his own land. I'd rather by his nailless hand, than to be the king of a vast domain, or be held by sin's dread sway. And rather of Jesus than anything this world. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Gracious Father in heaven, you've been so wonderful to us. We appreciate the gift of music and what it means to us. We can praise you. We can honor your name. As we proceed now with this next section, I ask for your Holy Spirit presence. We would pass the Spencer. Move him to say exactly what you want him to say. Open our hearts and minds. Help us to understand and give us that willing spirit to be obedient to your word. Make it clear to us, Lord, and may we be de determined to follow and do what you ask us to do. This is my prayer, and I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me well? Not yet. Is this on? It's probably not connected yet there. Did you have a good lunch? I know somebody. It's, yes, it's music distortion. I know somebody didn't like the, last, the lecture this morning because they tried to uh, kill me by food this afternoon. It was bringing all the things they could to benumb me for the afternoon. But I survived, even to dessert, and I'm ready to start. We're going to start with questions and answers. Uh, or comments, you can bring a comment if you want to bring it, but we'll have to do it timely, so we'll do that only until 3.30, so that we don't delay the rest of the program, because we are already set to finish at midnight, and we don't want to delay that. 
They are bringing papers. If you want to ask a question and you don't feel comfortable in asking openly, you can write it on a paper and we'll do it. And I will ask for assistance so that we can read the papers really fast. Does anybody want to start with an open question? Okay, let, I need help to see. I'm going to start this way. So we're going to start like this. And we go, okay? When in Revelation, every unclean. Well, it will be referring to all the things that are unclean. And music itself is not unclean, uh, but can be used both ways. We saw that Saul will be calmed down when a certain kind of music would be pl played. And we see that music can arouse other kind of behaviors. Every time there's a rock concert, things escalate exponentially. For instance, drug consumption, rape, they go like 500% higher than the regular in the areas where the concert is happening. So... All the unclean thing. That's why it doesn't say some unclean thing, but all the unclean things. So it will include also that, of course, because it's distorted adoration. Okay, next. I think you just have to press for a while until the light is on. Yeah, it's on. But they have to turn it there. Oh, it's because other, otherwise at home they won't hear it. It's fine. In my church, I get concerned with this, but now here I'm not. It's, we have to realize they, they have a lot of trouble to make it work. Hello, hello. Okay. Yeah, I play around with the saxophone, and uh, you, you said that the flutes and those other instruments should not be in a tabernacle. Okay, so that's how a very they relate that to church now. So should one who plays the saxophone leaves it at home and don't right. play instrumental in church? Very good question. In fact, I had somebody that asked me that question, and I noticed he was not clear in the lecture. So what I was explaining is the selection that was for Israel, concerning that the flutes were a very uh, popular instrument used outside. Let me explain what I meant. Let's imagine all those socks that are like a net, you know, that the, 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 the stockings that some, some women put on. Uh, there was a time that those stockings would be only used by prostitutes. So uh, would you like to use those stockings and people look at you in the street and say, hey, who's this woman? Uh, they, you might find them beautiful. So in those days, that instrument was totally associated with the uh, the, with the secular thing, that's why they were not using it. Now, it's not the instrument itself. It was, they didn't have all the technology we have, is the way it was played, and the Lord then made a selection like that. Like the drums, in all the pagan services, there were uh, drums used because the pagan service, I didn't talk about this this morning, but it's very important. I, there was a lot of things that I didn't talk about. The mentric effect is what is used for this, that's what is used in the tribal things in Africa. That's what is used in the uh, charismatic churches today. And it's used in the pagan religions. That's why they tell you repeat something. When you repeat several times, you get to a stage that your brain is kind of hypnotized. Now, the flute was not the flute itself that was the problem. It was the association. God was trying not to have any association. For instance, in the beginning of the church, the Christian church, uh, they wouldn't bring pianos into the church because pianos were mainly used in uh, uh, saloons and for people to dance, and they were trying to avoid the association. So some things that have a wrong association for a while, it's prudent not to bring, and that's why. But it's not the flute itself. It's that there was a... It's like, let me give an example that will be to our days. Is it okay if I bring my DJ thing into... It, it, that was a, it totally with the dancing, but it was not because the, the instrument itself had a problem. Did I answer? Yeah, in a sense. Uh, but a sax, for some persons, I remember when I started playing, 
they saw the sax as a jazz instrument. Okay. And I remember I went at a certain place and they asked me to do special music. And one of the leaders came to me and said, listen, don't play any jazz in here. I mean, he judged me. Yes, he saw the sax. You know, but uh, we You're also got to take into consideration the person, the motive, and the spirit in which he plays. Because any instrument, yes, any instrument you have can play any type of music. The, in fact, you brought a good point, and I, I'm going to use it to explain just one more thing here. I didn't say this in the morning, and this was a big miss because it's very important. Look at this. We started the lecture saying that Satan, Lucifer, defiled the sanctuaries, and it's, it mentioned the flutes and the uh, tablets because those were two main instruments in the outside parties, let's say, or feasts. Now, why would he defile? Look, this was used in the popular feasts, and God didn't want it in the temple. Look, popular music, pop music in the sanctuary was what defiled. The fact is not the instrument itself, is the association. Now, let me clarify some things here. Some people, they have a, a problem if you bring an electric guitar or an electric bass. The fact that the instrument is electrified by itself, electrification, the way, or electrifying, is just the amplifying of the sound of the instrument. So the simple fact that the guitar is electric or the bass is electric, that is not a problem. But I still have the bass from my rock band. It was a black bass, all shiny, and it has a shape, a rocky shape. Well, the first thing I did, I polished and I, I sanded this shiny, rocky looking, so it's now a wood base. It's still electrified, and I was planning on taking the edges because they look like those horns, you know, those guitars. So even if I'm playing, look at this, we have to understand the mind. Even if I come with a nice, rocky guitar with those horns on the edge, and I'm playing a classic music with it, the music is perfect. But the association, think about people that have come from the world, for instance, and they come and see those connections to the past. It's like an alcoholic that now at the church, can you imagine what an alcoholic will suffer when it's communion service in, the, in a Catholic church? It's like, well, I think only the priest drinks the wine, right? I don't know if that, no, no, they all drink. I remember in the service there, they all drink from the same cup. So this is a, this is, a pain for a guy that has a problem with alcohol. So we should avoid this kind of association. So if I'm going to get an electric guitar, common sense and wisdom will be, let me get one that appearance of, um, you know, of rock. Now, just a second, Sarah. I know you want to comment into this. Now, let us notice this. Sometimes we have to wait. Ellen White says we should not be the first ones nor the last ones. So... If you go with every fashion, sometimes you break too many uh, paradigms and people are not ready, paradigms, and people are not ready for the change. Now, of course, people have also a culturalization and problems that uh, you, you bring from, from your culture. If you go to a Middle Eastern country, you finish your meal and you don't burp, you are impolite. But if I come to a meal here and I burp, I am impolite. So we have to work with that. So play your saxophone at peace. <laughs> it's of course don't be jazzy, but you can. <laughs> but there's the, the saxophone is not the problem. Okay. <laughs> All right. You have a comment there. I know it's because that's why I'm letting you go and and speak because we are going this way. I know it's just a comment. Yes. Yeah. They, they, they need a mic, sorry. Maybe you should come closer. Because I'm going this side and then that yeah, way. We have I, to rush because of time. I don't want to get anybody's place. It's just that this is a very important question. And once he comes, I feel like I really want to get a little something. Uh, I would probably disagree on the sentence that any instrument can be played on a good way. 
because there are instruments that were made with purpose and the purpose was not good. So it's almost saying like a gun is, it's okay, it's just a gun. You can use it for good. We would get into a whole other discussion here, which is not the point. But what I want to say is that there are instruments that we can put it on the gray zone that, yeah, yeah you can play this way or you can play that way, like the piano, the guitar, we just spoke about it. There are other instruments that there's no way you can play them good. Like they the were made. The beer and bow that he was mentioning, that yes. is an instrument that there's no way you can play it for good. Or the drum set itself, one drum at a time, they were used before. You could kind of put them in the, you know, march and everything. The drum set as is, as we have it nowadays, go and search the history of it, how it came along. That instrument per se, as the connection of all of them, was built with an intention. And the builders, the creators of it, they themselves say that there's no way. I mean, that's that was the purpose of it. So I would say that, yes, many instruments can be played for any ways, good or bad. But there are some instruments that there's no way you can play for good. Yes. So those that's also should be what, the avoidable ones. So he was trying to mention. Let me clarify one thing about the drum set, which is the beats that I said. We are here on this row, which is the beats that I said. Once I entered, I was preaching in, uh, I think it was Boston. And I entered the church and there was a drum set. And I mean, I'm going to talk about music and there is an Adventist church. And I look at that and I sit there and then they have the worship. And the guy came very reverently, sat at the drum set and played really with reverence. And I right away thought about what people usually say. It's not the instrument, it's how you play. And that's... A t until a great extent, truth. And I looked at the, thank you. And I looked at the guy and I had, I had I'm, I've, I've been preaching this message since 2004. And I had to say, mate, I've been preaching this for all these years. Could it be that I'm wrong with this aspect? And I analyzed and I noticed something. Although he's playing reverend, it is impossible, impossible because of the way that the instrument was designed to play a drum set using the instrument, unless you go with one hand in one of the drums. It is impossible to not air the beat. What I'm saying is this. It is made to go in an in a upbeat. So when you do, boom, 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 automatically, unless you go there and you look like you don't know what you're doing with the instrument, the instrument will require from you to go on the wrong beat to emphasize the wrong beat because he goes, and of course I'm not even talking about the double beat they have now that with one uh, set of the foot. What I'm doing. When this one leaves one beat, the other one gets the other beat. So it's almost impossible. That's why the instrument, when it was separated, you could use some of the drums like the military effect that I said, but when they put it all together, it became impossible. So that's not possible to play that instrument as a fool the right way, even with reverence, without going to the wrong beat. So it's just a little bit of drugs, if not too much. I'm trying to be fast for the sake of time, but I don't want to leave any question and an answer, okay? So we have here, and we go there. We will reach there and come down this way. Is it again? Oh, and I have papers, yes. That's why I brought my wife. Otherwise, I will bring only half a brain. Go ahead. Is it on the mic? Sarah, can you help me with a question to you, please? So my question is, um, this morning you were mentioning that the unbalanced music has, um, it's, a, it's a hypnotic effect and it, plays on your emotions. emotions yes now in spiritual songs and hymns and stuff like that how do you um i guess is it okay that you have emotions when you're dealing with God? good question you know excellent how question are you going to be blessed if you didn't feel anything very good question uh yeah the fact that he says that true worshipers will worship in truth and spirit and truth, it doesn't mean that they discard emotions. It means that they are not led emotionally. So the, the answer for your question is very simple. And in fact, this is the answer for many questions. Melody, harmony, and rhythm 
they interact with spirit, ment mental, and, and uh, physical. So there's no problem if some emotional part is there as far as that's not what is leading. The problem with this kind of services is that they are mainly focusing on the emotional. Let me give you an example. Yeah, God is good. Sing with me, sing with me all together. Whoa. Yeah, the lyrics took like two minutes to compose because I had to correct one word that was wrong because in one second you made that lyrics. Obviously, the emphasis is not on the rational, but on the emotional. It's go, we are going into a drive with the beat and the way it goes, and we are all, some people are crying, and all I'm saying is God is good. That's good, but I mean, to the point of crying, you understand what I'm saying? So it's when the emphasis shift as the main focus being the emotional driven uh, um, um, conduction, okay? So, of course, I have cried with, with hymns from the hymnal, there are, and sometimes when it's something that you're going through in your life, uh, for instance, turn your eyes upon Jesus. It's hard for me to sing that song without feeling touched emotionally because it was a moment that we were going through a great crisis and the Lord brought that song at the special moment. So it has a meaning. There's nothing wrong about that. But now when you are, look, I'm going to put this in a very simple way. Uh, Brother Keith was, the other day, the lecture that I saw him here, he was talking about sugars. It's like quick sugars and real nutrients. When you take quick sugar, you feel like, woo, you're the king of the world, but you're nothing. You're just hyped. Some of those people, they come to the service, they get quick sugars. They are feeling like in heaven. Then they go home and nothing happens because they have no protein, spiritual protein, no, no energy, just quick energy from the, the calories. Okay? It's the problem. It's a question. Yeah. Sorry to be so fast. I'm, I'm trying to be merciful on you so that we don't stay here for too long. Some people ask me, how long are you going to take? And it was not my wife because she knows I'm taking long, right? So um, I'd like you to speak to the effect of culture in our present day on music in the Adventist church as opposed to like people's preferences. Okay. Uh, even though what you're saying to me is like, what you've been speaking about is like, okay, we'll never do that, in a sense. Too extreme, yeah. Right. But then there are subtle differences in the church that cause problems in terms of culture or personal preferences. How would you... Okay, that's a very excellent question. In fact, all of them have been. You know, culture is not a problem only with music. Uh... I went to Brazil and I was going to preach at the church and uh, they say, oh, we have a problem because we have another uh, program that is going to start after that and I know the lecture will take some time and this and that, so what should we do? I say, well, we do the AY earlier. No. AY is at 4. I say, why cannot it be 3.30? <laughs> no, no, everybody knows AY is at 4. Why? It's, I mean... Uh, where is that in the Bible? <laughs> no, it's, it's a cultural thing. Sometimes, oh, we don't kneel like that or we don't do like that. We have to be careful to not let culture influence. But culture will always influence. So the, the rule is very simple. Whatever culturally is not against what God has as a principle, God is totally okay with that. If there's no principle that is being undermined by culture, then it's okay. God likes the flavor of different cultures in different ways. Now, sometimes people take advantage of culture. Like they say, oh, yeah, you don't understand my culture. Let me tell you a very funny story. When I started preaching this, uh, the first recordings they did about this, I was preaching in the church. I didn't know somebody was recording and started spreading it. And soon it was all over the place. And, uh, but it was only audio. There was no video. And in Brazil, it's like the British and the Americans. I have like the British accent for them because, because they are South, South America. You know, the Portuguese has been changed. So it's like they hear this British guy. They imagine a pale white guy, you know. Uh, and, and this guy wrote a comment. Yeah, this is racism. He doesn't understand our culture. And the moderator had to say, uh, he is black. <laughs> 
So the guy heard the accent. What I'm trying to say is this. Culture will always influence the way we do things. There's no way to get out. Let me give you another example. I was doing the lecture, and sometimes the people that support you with this lecture, you have to be very careful because they are supporting you because you are defending what they think. But in the moment you say something they don't agree, you're doomed. Okay? So this lady was like, yes, you have to sing like this. She liked vibratos and all that. And if you don't sing that way, then it's not God. We have to understand that we grew up in a certain culture and there are wrong things in all cultures. So sometimes the way you like it and are used to, it might have been wrong since the beginning and they didn't know it. So as far as the cultural thing doesn't overpass. Now, one thing that I don't want to finish without saying in this topic is a lot of times people use the black culture as an excuse. And I'm saying predominantly blacks, but now whites are also using this as an excuse. We are being more vivid. Now, if you go to places where the culture is very dancey and stuff, usually in the churches they make even more effort to make a difference. In the islands where I was born, people are very, um, you know, hot, they are very... But the church has really rigid standards because they have to make a distinction between the behavior of what is common in the world and the gospel. So it's, it is not true that black churches have to do that because of culture. They do that because they like it. Okay? It's in the blood, but not all that runs in my blood is good. So I just want to clarify that this is not a racist comment or anything because I feel okay with both parts. I'm half black, half white. So I'm okay with or I'm 100%, 100% white. If you understand. In fact, I have a lot of mixing. I have Indians and a lot of stuff. Uh, so I own nations. <laughs> Told my they have to marry an Asian. That's the only thing that we are missing. <laughs> so... What I'm trying to say is this. We are to be reverent before God. It doesn't mean now that reverent is boring. You, you notice I move a lot. It's my culture. Sometimes I move too much and my wife's saying, it's not God's culture. You don't have to watch that. Okay? So I think I answered that. I had a lot I to say. This is a teasing topic, but I'm going to resist. We have here, we are going. Hello. Okay, so... I need some practical advice okay. to use within my home. Um, I grew up in Venice. I read, sang hymns and worship and everything. But um, when looking for a radio station, when you're at home or cleaning or positive music, we came upon Hey Love, which is Christian radio that had positive songs, you know? Um, what are you guys listening to? Um, because I want to bring in more positive music than what the world calls Christian. Okay. So this is for anyone in the church. If you have, I mean, we've listened to Christian Bardal. I think that's about it. Christian Bardal and... Ivor Myers also. Ivor Myers sings. Oh, no, no. I'm, I'm talking about music. I, music. Like, I, I thought Venice, you were saying lectures on the topic. I mean, at Venice Music. What are you guys okay. listening to? If you could cheer. All right. We're trying to move away from the K love. I want to generically say, and then you can go to my source of music. Uh, this is the thing. As I said in the morning, when I came to some conclusions in my life, I was about two years that I had no music in my computer. It was painful, but I, I was not clear and I didn't want to do anything wrong. Uh, you will be surprised. There's much more than what you think that is healthy. Okay, a practical thing that I will, when people, they say, oh, you explain some concepts, but I don't know them, and I don't get them. There's a simple test you can make. It's just a simple test. Don't take it prejudiciously. If you play something, and you lock the door and go to the other room, if what you hear the most is the right? stimulus, then that song is reverted. So even if you don't know where is the beat, first, second, 
if what you hear the most out there is that, because even in the Jewish culture, the timbrets will be mixed with the instruments. They wouldn't play the way we do, that there's a relevance on that. It's like chan 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 It's mixed. You and if you notice, they have mixed Jewish songs today that have an upbeat. Because they had to add into that. It was not in the Jewish original song. So we, for instance, when it comes to instrumental music, we have, um, uh, no, I'm not saying this as an example. I'm saying the solutions we find for ourselves. There's a collection that is worship with the harp, worship with the trumpet. Is instrument is the hymns in instrumental versions with nice arrangements that you can listen to. Then uh, we mentioned the academy. What's the name of that academy? Hals Anderson. Anderson. Not all the songs. They are still a little bit in the worship type, but at least they tried to do it clean. So I think they would need more of elevation and adoration music, but still you have a lot to do that. Then we have, we do some selections with a cappella. Is you know, you know, a cappella, the group. Not all a cappella, they, they do what I have I used to do as an excuse. I would do at the church, doom, doom, pff, ah, and then people will come and complain. I say, That's voice, God gave me the voice. It's just an excuse sometimes that people use. What else do we listen to? The Nablets. Nablets family, in my opinion, personal opinion, is the best we can find because he's technically very good and also spiritually and technically and spiritually correct. The Nablet's family, uh, Dr. Nablet, you know, uh, so they have several albums. Only there you find a lot. The couple that reach, they, yeah. Very good, very good. It's good quality. It doesn't sound like, because sometimes we do music that is spiritually correct, but poor quality, technically speaking. And for a musician, that's sometimes hard. No, but they have good quality, technically speaking, and clean. I don't think I know of them. Sounds like rain. You mentioned earlier today that if we're going to tell our kids, you know, don't listen to this, you have to have something to offer. We strive. But what I was trying to say, I'm going to say something that is a little bit hard to hear. Sometimes... God won't give you alternatives until you make a decision. Let me give you an example. I don't want to shock anybody. You will never like carob until you stop eating chocolate. This is coming from a chocolate specialist that now is a carob specialist. I eat carob now and I feel like I'm eating chocolate, but for a while it was not so until I made a solid decision I'm going to stop this. Okay? So we have to cooperate. Okay? So, all right. Abigail Miller. In fact, I don't worry too much about that because my wife makes the collection for me. So I get a lot of good songs. Yes, yes. So in terms of the criteria, we start listening to those things and our taste will get used to it. But we can give you a list because one of the problems sometimes is that we, we bring the problem but we don't bring the solution. Well, we have a lot, a lot of music in our phone. Sister, I know you are, is a comment on this? Because I'm going this way around. We will get there to you, okay? So I'm, I'm sorry, I'm prioritizing the left, the right wing and then... <laughs> No, no, I'm not going to take sides. Which, because the right and left, it depends on how I am. Use the mic, please, because of the streaming. Okay. Yeah, so my question is more of, um, whenever I first came to the church, I really loved music from when I was not in the church. And um, I really admired, like, the early Advent believers. Mm -hmm. you know, like, so during the time of William Miller and Joshua B. Himes, and they were making hymns. They were making our hymnal. And 
So what would you say to the youth and others who want to make new hymns okay. and make them according to the blueprint? Because I appreciate that you're telling us what not to listen to and what to look out for, but it's also inspirational for those of us who want to obey the Lord to want to make music that doesn't have the errors in it, you know, that we can all enjoy. And so I just wanted to know what are your thoughts on any of us who want to make music, new music, what, what should we do to go about doing that? Okay, that's a very good question also. I have to tell you, I have composed Christian reggae and Christian rap. I have in among, I have to throw, I have more than a hundred compositions that were not worth it. <laughs> I, could, I could not reuse. So it's good that we know because inspiration, it's a spiritual word. It means an air that is given to you that is ideas to you. You are never neutral in inspiration. Either you are inspired by God or you are inspired by Satan. Okay? And I thought in most of my compositions I was inspired by God, but Ellen White has an, an, as, as a, an expression, she says, some that are very technical with music understand nothing about doing music for God because they go after their idols. So I was listening to you too, and my songs will sound just like that. The hymns you, you reproduce. So let me clarify this because you brought a very important topic. Some people that say, if you don't sing in the hymnal, then it's not good. Well, we have to understand that the hymnal didn't start like that. Before they didn't have the hymnal, and even when the hymnal was being made, Luther, which was one of the biggest contributors to the hymnal, he had a lot of hard times. For instance, when you sing that song, God has spoken through, this, is, this was a popular song. And he used and made a new lyrics for that. He didn't have too many alternatives. So there's not a problem on the youth or the church members composing new songs. And we are singing new songs that are not in the hymnal. Because the hymnal is not like the biblical canon. If it's out of there, it's not. Some people use that argument. They say Ellen White cannot be a true prophet because she's not in the Bible. We will have prophetic inspiration out of the canon. The canon is a parameter, and but other prophets, Enoch is not in the Bible, and he had prophetic inspiration, and others had. So we just have to realize when we compose a new song, what is the source of our inspiration? If we are consuming pop, worldly music, that will be seen in our composition. And what happens with many compositions that are new, like we have very good songs from youth camps uh, that we sing that are not in the hymnal, and sometimes some of them, they add them to the hymnal because they are very good. They don't even have to sound just like the typical hymnals, hymnal songs because some of them, they came from periods, and you can tell that it's a, a kind of... A, the other day, my wife was bringing a new song that I didn't know from the hymnal. And I could tell what is next because it's typical the way they do this song structure. It doesn't have to be exactly like that as far as it doesn't go against the principles that we are saying. So if it's not just a repetitive sound, uh, there was a song from a famous Brazilian uh, Adventist pastor, singer, and the song was a mantra. So you will, you will go and repeat several times. Uh, first, you will use expressions that are not typical, like spirit of flight, you know, very spiritualistic. And you will be repeating the same part. It was not in the hymnal, and it should not be even in our songbooks, right? So we have, to, we have to go with the principles. It doesn't have to be exactly like the hymnal, but still in the principles. It will smell a little bit like a cultural moment that we are living, but it cannot go out of that. Yes, you need to get the mic. Mic because of the, the media thing. Okay, my wife told me it was just a dream that I will stop with the questions at 3.30, but I think it's important that we clarify those things. But she's contributed to this, right? Okay. Okay, okay, we'll go a little bit more. 
Yeah, it's quick. It's just that uh, nowadays we are also in a crisis with music. I think we all got to that conclusion. There's a big division within the Adventism because there's this side of music, there's that side of music. Some want to go by what they like. The other ones want to get stiff with what is safer, which is what it was before. So there's a big crisis, and we are aware of that. And what, I, what we have said to our children is many times when we are invited to do special music, it was that drama. It's like, okay, what are we going to sing? And then we, we pick a song. It's like, well, huh, well, that song, we're not sure. We're not sure, you know, who composed it. And then you go all through the, the process of researching who, who wrote it, who sang it, then make a search on YouTube. Oh, no, look, this is being played like this. No, we don't want anybody to search this song and bump with this. No, we don't want to sing this. So it's all this process of, and I think that goes into what you were asking, basically. So what we have told our children is mainly is like, well, God has, give us, has given us many gifts, right? And he wants us to develop even more for his own glory. So we told them, and this, this morning, actually, it wasn't one of these cases. And what we have for you in the evening, it's not one of these cases. But if we go online, you'll see that many of the songs that we have sang have been composed by them. That we have said, well, you know, to make it the safest way, God has given you gifts. You know how to write. You know the, the doctrine. You know this. You know that. You so know music. Them, just you do it. By our kids. By them, our oh, children. Oh. Being that we have counseled our children as we do that. I don't have the talent for music to write or to compose or nothing like that. He does. My children do. I go along. All happy. But see, what happens is that many times what happens is that we don't have a lot of source. And there's a lot of confusion going on. So we run some risks. So if there's a risk, go safer. That's, that's what we have said. And my daughter once was invited to play with a, one of our colleges, one of our renowned colleges. And when they sent her the song for her to play, she analyzed it. She was like, eh, not sure about that. And in the middle of the orchestra, she was sitting there. She played all the hymns that they had for the worship with the hymn and all. And when the special music came along, she just put, put her violin down and she didn't play. It's a, it's a matter of whether you really want to participate in worship that will be for God or if you will not be. It's, it, it's a very, very, you know, thin I, I want to area. expound in this that Sarah is saying to, for us to understand. We are at this moment in a battlefield between God's worship and Satan's worship. And I say it very boldly, Satan's worship. It says in Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 2, that he's sit on the temple of God as to be God. I do believe that Satan and God are racing at this moment. Church after church, and I'm talking about not only Adventists, but also Adventist churches, to have their sign on the worship. That's why I don't want to promote anything that has to do with the opposing industry. Jesus said, he that is not with me is against me. So we always check who composed this because that means the source of that inspiration. And I'm going to mention some. I don't want to make anybody feel uncomfortable. But we have some movements that are very iffy. Like, for instance, a lot of people consume Michael W. Smith, right? If you see the source of this, and the kind of music that is written... Uh, some of them are very spiritualistic and other are ecumenical. And so we have to check. And he has uh, admitted to be involved in wrong things, like toxic things and stuff. So how come this person is being used by God and because he's promoting an entire movement that is leading people into mantric worship, that is leading people into the blindness that will lead them to be fooled by Christ? So I don't want any association with that. So if the song belongs to that movement, we avoid. Now, it doesn't mean that some of those songs cannot be cleaned out or you hear a version and it's not appropriate with the technical aspect, spiritually speaking, but it's worse in those cases. And most of them, most of them, they go with mantric repetitions. This is basically one of the key elements because the mantra leads you to the that state of mind. We have just a comment here, and then I'll go there. But we need to go to shift to this side. This lady, she's going to get tired soon. You just wanted yeah, to yeah, comment I something. Wanted to say it's just this, a, I wanted to say this church is, is filled with musicians. No, no, yeah. the Seventh-day Adventist church. Yes. I believe that we need to get people who are really converted. Yes. 
who are led by the Spirit, pray and come together and make powerful music. Okay. My father is a musician and he's not a Venice, right? We need to convert him. Yeah, I've been praying and working with yes, him. Recently, he said he wanted to write a religious song. But I'm saying, when there were other artists and musicians coming back, say they're giving their lives to Christ and bringing the, the same music and mixing, he said he's not going to do that. Because once he's converted, he's totally gospel. Amen. Right? But I believe that we as a church, and I think it's the mindset of the people too, because when you come in and you say, listen, let's do something. Let's make music. People believe that the hymnal is the only way yes. for us to produce good music. Yes. Let me share a story with you. I had a friend of mine. He was going to a gospel concert. He enters the elevator. And uh, he's there. And there are a bunch of guys in there. And this guy is saying, man, I'm so tired of this life of these going back and forth in these uh, trips and stuff, cursing and cursing and talking. And my friend said, I was so uncomfortable, I said, these guys are coming to a gospel concert and talking so worldly and cursing in, in the elevator and stuff. They come out, my friend goes one way, they go another way. When he sits to start the concert, those guys were the musicians. Those guys were the musicians. So he was really shocked, but just to tell you that you will be surprised with the things we find from subliminal messages in Adventist singers, from all kind of uh, uncaught thing, like he was saying uh, here. So, yes, we have there, and then we're going to shift to this side, okay? Real, real quick. Um, just to add to your point, I grew up listening to the heritage singers. Oh, okay. You want to open the can of worms, huh? No, no, no. <laughs> no, but uh, remember they had the bass. You know, they used a lot of bass and beat. Yeah. Now we could sing these songs now, the without those instruments and the lyrics well in light. The same thing that we do in Spanish. So guess what? I'm bringing them back because you know why? Impacted a lot of life. Yes. And until now, now people are still singing them. I have to say this when you say I will have to ask which era. Exactly. Okay? Like go. many of our groups, sorry to say, this, and my point is not criticizing, but it's yeah. the principle. Yeah. So little by little was shifting. If you take all the Brazilians, they produce a youth DVD, um, CD every year. New songs. They have a lot of composers. They are very mus musical. And man, when I arrive in Brazil... Until then, from then until now, it's got nothing to do. If you go to the youth CD, it has changed totally. Just to let you know that the devil is after all of us. And if we don't keep an eye, okay? But just, uh, just a side note. Yes. So, uh, just to be clear, are we talking about worship music and God's sanctuary, or are we talking about... Because as far as worship in God's sanctuary, hands down, we all by now got to know that the profanity cannot be mixed with the sacred. Amen. When we come into God's church, you know, we're really in the presence of the Almighty One and everything has to be appropriate. Not just music, I mean everything. Amen. The way we appear, the, the clothes we wear, you know, everything. Just like if we're going to be in the presence of the governor or the president. Everything got to be appropriate. Now, we're talking about, are we talking about music in general? I mean, that's my first question. In general or just music and the sanctuary? It's good. In fact, I'm liking this question and answer sessions because a lot of things that I didn't mention in the sermons are now being brought. Let us understand this because there's also a lot of prejudice when it goes to that. We are going to consider three things. I'm going to start with secular and holy. And then I'm going to bring a third one, like secular, holy, and worldly. And I'm going to explain this with an example. The Sabbath is a holy day. Working is a secular activity. So on the Sabbath, I don't work. 
But I can work on the other day. Some people think they cannot, but you can. It's not worldly unless I work on a pub. That's worldly. But working is just secular. So the same thing happens with music. There is holy music, secular music, and worldly music. Now, there's not a problem for a Christian to listen to secular music, like chan 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 cha da cha da chan chan It's a secular music. As far as that music is not in the structure or in the content opposing to God's principles, because then it will become worldly. So what is the problem with secular music? We have to look at the music and ask ourselves if it is secular or worldly. The lyrics is one thing that will help us. Like, you know that song that says, I've got cocaine running around in my brain? No doubt. <laughs> oh, it's worldly. But some of the music are going against God's principle very discreetly. If you have a song that is telling, listen to your heart, yellow flag. Yes, you're not attacking adultery or anything like that, but this is not from God. Although he's, the song may be clean, but that is not the right content. So it's very hard to find secular music today that is not worldly, but you still have. You know, Ellen White has a comment where she said she was in, the, in a festival in Germany and they were playing beautiful secular music in the garden. It was not him, but it was culture. I'm, I'm, I'm not, now, that brings me to my... Yes, yes. That brings I did, me, I did. Now, that brings me to my second part of my okay. question, uh, which is a scenario, okay? Uh, I remember one night I was coming from work late uh, because I mean, it was one of those days when I... Uh, I covered an extra shift for one of my colleagues. And then it way past my bedtime and I'm coming home and I'm very sleepy. Very, very, very sleepy. By the time for me to get to my home, I gave up. What woke me up is, is, my, bro is uh, my broken glass. I already, the car already left, kind of left the road, went in the bush and then you know, landed somewhere, and then the glass broke, and the flakes of the glass uh, uh, woke you up. My face, that's what would be. <laughs> but thank God it wasn't too fatal. I was still able to, you know, uh, drive home. So it's not, although you know, I don't, I run the thousand working late all the time, but there, there were days like that somehow. And of course, all my family said, hey, listen, and I know you. Uh, what you're about, you know, everything, you know, it's all about reform, but on the road, you have whatever it takes to keep you away. Okay, I know where you're going. <laughs> so, since that time, when, I'm, when I found myself in that situation again, I'm going to play that Christian music that has those beat in them, and I assure you, it keeps me away till I get home. Okay. Not my favorite, not my taste, but it gets me, you know, the next time it did get me home. Uh, I... So this is the scenario. What do you say? Okay, look, I can talk from an experience self and in first hand because I have a problem with driving by night. I usually say that after sunset, I have two hours of grace. And then after that, I like seeing three roads. Once Sarah woke me up, I was holding very tight to the wheel on the other lane already sleeping. And she was trying to pull me in. So uh, Jesus was at the cross ready to die. It was almost finished, but he didn't say it was finished yet. And Satan offered him a possibility to numb his senses so that he wouldn't feel the pain so intensively. And Jesus said, no, I want to be alert until the last minute for my mission. I don't recommend, and I can tell you some things that could help you being awake. One of them is lemon. I tried that, driving to Rio. You'll just get there with your mouth like, <laughs> but it will keep you awake. But 
usually you see, look at this. It's like people that get involved in intimacy before marriage, and then they marry no matter what, because now we got to get married. You don't fix a mistake with the other. If you are having a problem of sleeping, most likely you have all the things that you need to solve in having a balanced shift and uh, trusting that God will provide still. And then it's not a good idea to use it. Let me give you an example that you will understand. Let's say you have a book, an audio book, that will keep you awake, but it was written by someone that curses God whether they are aware or not. So, uh, look, I'd rather sleep in Jesus than being awake by the devil. <laughs> I'm just recommending. It's your decision. But I do believe that song system that is happening now, it is devil worship. Although people believe it or not. I was doing devil worship without knowing. So I don't recommend we have any association with that. I will discard, especially when you're about to sleep, your brain goes in alpha mode, you consume all that is coming, and this will undermine your spiritual alertness. So I'm not talking only to you, I'm talking to all of us, because you brought it to all of us. Even about to die, Jesus said, no. So I recommend we follow that example. It's not easy. There's another thing that I can tell you that can help you being awake, at least for me, it works. We will talk about that. But lemon, for sure. Because even my wife smacking my neck, not as strong as lemon. <laughs> okay, sister, we are finally on this side. Thank you very much, all of this. Oh, we have one more? Okay, sister. This sister is a good Christian because she's been patiently waiting. Yes, she's been patiently waiting for a long time. We don't want to jump sides here, oh, okay. so we finish here and then we go. Thank you. The enemy has been around for 6,000 years, and he knows how to get us with music. One day, we will have to stand in front of the Lord when he comes, which that's going to be very soon. And we, what excuse are you going to give him? My culture, my this, my that. We could give him a lot of excuses, but on that day, there will be no excuse. Yes, amen. amen. Yes, amen. thank you. Amen. That's very good. So we have to be enlightened, seek for the truth, and practice it in the power of God. Very good. I want to say one thing as we go through this. It's not to test your passion even more. <laughs> we are to, like Sister said, watch our lives before the Lord. But in Brazil, I saw a bumper sticker that said, I talk a lot about Brazil. I was there. That's where my ministry started with this uh, topic. And we were like five years and a half preaching in there. All over the place. And bumper stickers, they have good ones. And one was saying, God gave each one of us a life for us to have something to take care of. Which means you're not taking care of other people's lives. Another one that I saw that was very good, it said, I'm going to take care of my health because there's a lot of people already taking care of my life. So I would recommend that we don't make this a battlefield against others. So even if your entire church is thinking differently, you have two options. Either you take it and endure, or you seek for a church that will be more aligned to what you. But you don't, you enlighten them, and that's it. If they keep wanting to go in a different direction, you are not God. And even God gave them freedom. You have to give them freedom also, okay? Just a side note, because sometimes we might get tricky with this. Sister, your time arrived. Well, and actually some of the previous questions addressed a little bit, but I really appreciated what you shared earlier about at, uh, before and after the tabernacle in and out. And I think Brother Carl sort of touched on this. Is there music that, and I, and I think I understand your answer about secular versus worldly, so I just want to kind of clarify, music that wouldn't necessarily be appropriate in worship in the sanctuary, but it is okay to be listening to as you're driving down the road, let's say, or like my sister said, cleaning the house, you know. I used to love to clean the house to Mary Mary. 
That gets your I, house I clean from the ceiling to the floor. You get the whole keep, place keep in mind, clean. You're talking to a man that used to love to push ups and jump rope with Marilyn Manson. Oh no, Both I don't need the power and pump. I don't know if Mary and Mary's quite that bad, but they're no. probably not too far off. <laughs> but many of the sisters in here know what okay. I'm talking about. I don't listen to Mary Mary anymore, but that's how now you are patient. <laughs> There are, you know, situations where you may be active, working, you know, you're not, you're not in worship, you're cleaning the house or you're cooking or you're outside doing, mowing the lawn or you're doing something. And I'm not saying that we can't be singing hymns then because the Lord has brought me to the place where I'm doing that and I'm enjoying singing hymns while I'm in the garden to myself that uplift me and bring me to the Lord. But so do I understand your statement that you know, there is secular music that is acceptable to be listening to because it's not worldly. It's not what you would listen to or play in church. But, you know, you're doing your secular activities. Yes. Uh, it's good. It's going to complete the rest of what I was saying there. Let me make some divisions here. I experienced something. Yeah, I go to Brazil again. Uh, those guys are playing soccer and listen to King Geralt's. And I'm saying, guys, it is much better to listen to a clean secular song than to be knocking each other's chins and listening to worship. He's like, yeah, no, you, you, you tripped me here, no. And the rise of the background has no sense. So I want us to see these three stages, two the three ones that I said, look, first, worldly, secular, and holy. Now, secular and worldly music should not come to the holy moment. And in the holy things, we have three stages, worship, elevation, and adoration. Not all the songs, for instance, this is a very important thing. Father Abraham has many sons. This is a worship song, not an elevation or adoration song. Should not be in the temple. Uh, you see, we're not going to move your leg, move your leg. The temple will lose his reverence with this. But there's no problem on worshiping God with this song, with the kids outside and helping them. Kids, for instance, they need more movement because they don't synthesize uh, abstract elements. So he says, into my heart. They... They are seeing this happening so that they, they will synthesize. But so not all the hymns should be in the sanctuary, but we can have worship moments out of the sanctuary that can be more dynamic. For instance, I have a song that I don't play it in the sanctuary or sing it in the sanctuary. I'm just showing these as examples, but you understand. It's, it's like, God is good to me. God is good to me. And then he held all my hands and helped me stand. It's a dynamic song. It is not appropriate that I tell you, let's go all stand and now we all sing this because it takes a lot of movement and loses the reverence. It's worship, but it's not elevation or adoration. Look, those three are like the courtyard, the holy place, and the most holy place. So in the Sabbath school, we are in the holy place. That's why we change ideas, we share comments. In the divine service, we go to the most holy place. Now, Everybody's quiet and we hear what the Lord has to tell us. And we hope that the preacher is being totally used by God in that sense. So this is in the adoration section. Now, in the secular round. So secular music and worldly music should not be brought to the worship. Um, Worship songs should not be used in elevating or adoration moments, but all holy music can be used in secular moments as far as we don't desecrate it. Because I'm going to give you a nice, funny example. My father used to be upset with my mom because she will be doing the cleaning. And uh, let's, uh, let's see a song. Um, Trust and obey. Daniel, could you bring me this and that? Everything that will say, Rachel, 
I need you here now. We are almost done for sunset. But, uh, and my father will be really upset. He's like, I mean, do you worship <laughs> or do you give commands and do? So, you know, we have to also be careful. But there's no problem on using worldly, I'm sorry, holy music in worldly activities if you're not going to desecrate them. No, no, I'm saying. No, holy, holy music in secular activities. Yes. No, uh, mundane activities, okay? No, no, I said the other way around. There's no problem on bringing holy music to secular activities if we are not going to desecrate them. I think it's a desecration if I'm playing uh, in, a, in a gambling house and I'm listening to hymns. I mean, it doesn't match, but... If you're in a, just a secular activity, you can bring songs. It's not a problem. Yes. I, I just want to help clarify one thing, just in case anybody takes it the wrong way. When he was talking about the hymnal and he said, and you said Enoch uh, is inspired, he wasn't talking, you weren't talking about the book of Enoch. You were talking that Enoch is inspired. Outside. Yes, Enoch, Enoch yeah. the, the because prophet. I don't want anybody to think. Not oh, the book you know, of Enoch. Thank yeah, you. Yes, I, I just wanted to make that clarification because there may be somebody here that says, "Oh, yeah, I'd have to go." No, that is not inspired, and we don't. No, 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 no. It. It's not Enoch the book. Is uh, the book of Jude said thus prophesied Enoch the seven after? So he was a prophet, but we don't have any writings from him in the Bible. Thank you for clarifying that. We sometimes one thing and it's taken in a different way. Any other question from this side? If not, we are going to, huh? Oh, papers. We're going to, sister, and then we go to the papers. I really need to finish this all, guys. Do we have no lecture for the afternoon? How do you, look, how do you address some of the hymns in the hymnal that is um, talking about praise to the rising sun? And we know it's there, but we are not doing anything about it. Let That's us, true. Let us uh, Many of the hymns we have were borrowed from uh, other churches, from other things. So most of the email, I'll say 99.999%. Uh, that hymn, I really have a little issue with that. Although I understand what he's trying to say, he was not the, very, the best happy medium on that case. The expression turned because... In the sanctuary, they will exactly do the other way around. They will turn their back to the rising sun. Uh, so, yes, I agree with that. So keep in mind that humanly we might make mistakes. So that hymn is, is a bad expression. That has some cultural influence. It could be changed. It's just a little detail. Okay? But sometimes we have to be careful. I heard somebody saying, oh, um, to the choir of the archangels, there's no archangels, but uh, Jesus is not true. There are other archangels be before, be besides Jesus. Okay, but that one is really a tricky thing. We're going to the papers, okay? Classical music. The most classical music is good, technically speaking, because in those days it was before the revolution. So music was not affected by the revolution that happened in the 60s. But some composers, they were worldly and satanic. Uh, I think it's Paganini. He was assumedly uh, in, with, with the spiritual wrong inspiration. Uh, the, the, who, who composed the magic flute? It was Mozart, right? Mozart. Also, we had many, sometimes you listen to the titles and it's all mythology. The fairy, uh, the magic flute. Some of those composers, as the church was the one sponsoring, they will compose things that were spiritual or kind of disguised, but they were not spiritual at all. So Mozart uh, was totally out. Now, technically, the song may not have a problem, or even the song structure itself, but some of the times they have. Some, some parts of Paganini, they say that until this day, people cannot play. Uh, so not you would have to do some research on that, but I would say that most of the 
classical music is quite fairly okay and, and clean, I would say. I don't like to give answers like this because I'm not giving you concepts. I think we spoke about the concepts in the morning, so I'm just helping you applying them. So in terms of melody, harmony, and rhythm, most of the classical music have no problem. In terms of the content, they are defined. Sometimes it's like, you know that song? It was one of my favorite operas. But it's totally satanic. It's all about fairies and uh, witches. And uh, so they are not singing, but they are dedicated songs. So we have to be careful with that. You wanted to say something there? You need to have a microphone. In regards to the classical music, sometimes I think it's a blurry line because we have a lot of new composers. And now that will be affected by the revolution. So how do we okay. differentiate? Now, uh, modern classical music is not called classical, although it's composing like that. You had, you had Vangelis, you had, um, what was his name? Um, well, you, you have several. Uh, it's more, it's called like contemporary classical music, which is different. In that case, you have to be careful, and I'm glad you mentioned that because I want to bring another topic here, because many of them are new age. So I used to listen to a lot of Anya, Anya Watermark, totally new age, Celtic music. New age goes with one different kind of mantra. Okay, this is very important. Very, very important. There's the rhythmic mantra, which is by the constant beat and stuff, you reach to the nirvana, to the exodus in your brain. But there's melodic mantra, which is what new age uses. For instance, it goes like, those sounds that are like shallow fading using a repetitive mode uh, like what is the name of that guy there's a guy that is very known he's even a Christian but he composes uh, music like that you have to be very careful and for instance some uh, musicians, they mix both. Techno music uses melodic mantra and rhythmic mantra. It will start like... You see the sound, you're, you're both... This was one of the things that will get me in YouTube, YouTube because YouTube, they use melodic mantra and rhythmic mantra. It's a lot of guitars going... Those sounds, they fade and repeat. So many of them, they are composed like if they were the classical music, and a lot of people listen to that, and it's really, your mind starts whoo, relaxing. Like most of the relaxation music that you find on YouTube is New Age stuff. It's the concept of New Age meditation is empty your mind. You empty your mind. When the concept of Christian meditation is you fill your mind. Because the empty mind is an invitation for Satan. So you fill your mind with the Word of God so that your mind is not empty. So when those songs go very trantic, you know, taking you to the moon and back, watch out. What would you say about contemporary Christian music? Chords on the piano that are mainly 7th, 9th, 11th, and 13th. What about blue bluegrass gospel music? Is, all, okay. is it all bad? All right. Let me ask you this. Let's go straight to the point here. Who invented bluegrass for what purpose? Adoration? No. Okay. So it is secular. If it is not worldly, which is bluegrass, you usually lose your dog, your house, and your family and all that, right? So it's already talking, usually it's my wife left me all alone. It's just, what, what is the goal? Okay? So I don't know about blue, I don't know if I'm going ignorant about this, but I understand it's southern country music with mix there, right? Isn't that? Am I wrong or right? Oh, is that a chung? Okay, okay. Well, 
some of a similar style, I would say, no, I'm sharing perspectives, okay? I'm not putting myself as the law. Some of those similar styles we think, I would see appropriate in a, in a setting like a camp out or that we have like Father Abraham or some songs like more like that. If I'm, I'm not too familiar with, sorry, my ignorance. Uh, but, uh, we, but not for a, whenever it's too much what, with what is a secular setting of that, we should avoid to bring it to the church because you will bring associations. Are you with me? So even if it's clean, sometimes you will bring associations. I want you to keep this in mind. In the sanctuary, there was a special scent recipe that only the priests could produce. It's an aroma that nobody else was allowed to because God wants to clearly have just for himself. I usually use an illustration that I didn't present today also. Let's say your girlfriend is coming and is offering, or your wife is offering you a little, no, it's better a girlfriend for this example, is offering you a little teddy bear. So, oh, I, I, I know you like teddy bears. You have a teddy bear collection. Oh, yeah, I do. And you get the teddy bear, and the teddy bear is written there, Mark. And you look at that and say, well, Mark, but my name is Charles. You said, yeah, this teddy bear I gave to my previous boyfriend. But as we broke up, and uh, I got all of my teddy bears back, and I know you have a collection of teddy bears. And you feel like uncomfortable. Say, oh, well, if you are uncomfortable, we will raise Mark and right here, Charles. This is what many of us are doing to God. Teddy bears that were given to Satan. We want to clean the name and write Jesus. And we want him to be happy. Oh, a teddy bear that was for Mark. Now it's for me. No. Okay. So whatever is not specially dedicated to God. Now sometimes things that were secular for no alternative, they were brought and dedicated. You had a secular tree. And you say, I'm going to dedicate this tree to the Lord. But now you cannot go back. It's for the Lord. So music that are connections to other secular things, it's preferable to avoid, to bring. Now, of course, you will always be influenced by the way you are surrounded with. And the Lord understands that. Okay? I need to make a comment. Yes. Just a comment on that. Uh, I think the biggest problem is that most of the times we tend to bring stuff that are according to our taste on how we feel or how we like. So if... If we, if we put our likes and our wishes aside and go by principle, today we learned a lot of principles. If we put those principles in front of us, then it's not, I mean, if my, if my hymn is sounding bluegrass, then I am trying to accommodate my taste into the hymn. So who am I, what is the hymn for? If it is for God, it needs to accommodate his taste, not my taste. I need to adapt my taste to his taste and not the other way around. So many times we bring stuff, we're trying to baptize the pork and then say we can eat it. So the fact that these things are more, are connected to a worldly or even secular, some, some secular stuff we're not supposed to mess up with. So... Just to just to make it easier, you know, if you're having any questions and any doubts, just put it on the scale. Is this because you like it or is it because it's within the principal range? Okay. Let's we need to close this. I'm sorry. Otherwise, Pastor Wint uh. will take me to the board. Okay, the this one I think it was mostly touched with what about classical music? What about minutes and sonatas and suits? Are those dance music? What is Ellen White referring to when she says dance music? And then right. if you want to connect it right away with the next one, most types of music you described well. Can you explain what jazz is exactly? Mm, okay. No, well, I'm going to shock you probably, but uh, dancing is not a sin. <laughs> <laughs> I want to clarify what I said. I first wanted to shock you, and then dancing is just moving the body to some sound. When I was a kid, my father would used to come to saw, and I would dance to the sound of sewing. Sewing. Uh, now, what I'm trying to say is this. Kids, they move naturally. We, we can move. The problem that the word dancing is used several times is because very seldomly, dancing is not associated with worldly things or uh, bad things. But I gave the example, Jewish dancing. It's very like the kids in, in a, you know, going roundabout and all that stuff. 
It's got nothing evil. It's not like the belly dancing from the Arab culture or Middle Eastern cultures. That's not what we are talking about. Okay? And no, I'm not contrasting Arabs with Jews. Both have good things and bad things in their culture, like we do in our culture. Just want to clarify that so that we don't have any confusion there. So when we are talking about dancing, we are talking not about the simple fact of moving your body, but usually what is the culture. If you notice, believe me, I know, there was the guys, when I would go to the nightclubs, there was the, I would say, the cup holders. It's the guys that don't, don't dance a thing. They are just there standing. And if you notice, when people are dancing in any setting of this kind of music, they are not just dancing. They always try those moves and those things, and you, you see the faces and everything. Everybody's trying to be sensual, to look good, to exhibit themselves. So usually all the basis of that. Now, some people try to bring artistic dancing and everything. Just because it's classical, it doesn't mean that it's good. Look at those semi-dressed semi ladies in ballet and all those things. It's, I mean, so the point here, when Ellen White talks about dancing, it's the heavy culture setting that is on the dancing thing itself. Now, it's not because you find your, your kid, la, 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 you're tsh, no dancing, no, no. It's not what we're talking about. Are we clear about that? I think I answered that. Friends, I don't know if we have time to go to the other lecture. It's up to you. I don't, I don't want to over, overload you with anything. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to shift gears here and we go to the next topic, okay? Maybe uh, you guys could just stand up and breathe deep so you don't fall yes, asleep rapidly, at the next one. Let us just stand. Just breathe. Yes. Not, no dancing, just breathing. <laughs> now, I have something. Yeah, breathing will bring oxygen to your brain and will help, okay? I have something that I want to put before you. I'm making a choice here. I, these lectures, they started in Portuguese. Then I started bringing them into Spanish. Then I started bringing them into English. But recently, we were at 3 ABN. Uh, to 3 ABN Latino. So I redid the series for that event. So the most recent version is in Spanish. Most of it is pictures. And what I will say will explain all that I'm saying there. Would you mind if I use the Spanish version? Okay? If you feel bothered, we can start and go to the English version. But the English version is older. So the only thing is when we get to the Bible texts, I will ask you to open and read, okay? Instead of just reading from there. But it's the most, ver it's the most recent version, and I think we can gain more of it. Okay, I know a lot of you here understand Spanish. For those who don't, I don't think it will disturb you. But if you feel that, you let me know. Okay, friends. I want to have just a brief word of prayer. I want to tell you that this topic is probably as important as the previous one. It's a very, very serious topic. And as I told you, I have two passions. I had two passions in my life that were trapping me, music and multimedia. So this one is about multimedia. So let us kneel for a brief word of prayer as we enter the topic. Beloved Father in heaven, we have come a long way since your creation and many things were lost along the way. We need your help. We need your direction. And we pray at this moment that you may, in spite of the uh, weather, in spite of the long time we've been here, that we may be blessed, Father, and that we may grow. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Can I use this table again, Brother Ilman?
Okay, friends. So our lecture, I'm going to try to summarize as much as I can, is a combination of several. We will start to see a little bit of the history of multimedia. because That will give us a hint of where we are going. What is the goal? And then we will go and see. I always follow this sequence. Most of the things we have doubt about, if you check the history of it, you will have no doubts. Okay? I don't want to bring more worms to the can, but sports were brought back, were created by the Greeks. They are, they have a part in the statue. Okay? The Greek culture. They were brought back by Masons. That's the history. You take your conclusions. Okay? So, what I'm trying to say is, as we look at the history, you will already see a lot of the trend and the goals. Then we look at the effects. We'll talk a little bit of the effects. I want to say that my goal with these lectures, my goal with these lectures is not only to tell us how good or bad something is, but also my lectures pointing to the final Armageddon, the battle, the final battle. I do believe that Satan is striking when two armies will be one against the other. One will try to intimidate the other. Satan is trying to reduce our power for the final clash. Armageddon is a battle in the mind, in the frontal lobe mostly. That's why I call it the war of the senses because it has to do with the avenues of the soul. So we're going to start by the history of multimedia. And you will be surprised, but never forget that Daniel 2 has a lot to do with our culture today. That statue is about the worldly kingdoms and how Satan tries to bring his culture against God's culture. So our history of multimedia really started in Greece. If we don't go before to the party that Balthazar was giving there and inviting everybody. But the ones that started this theatric arts strongly were the Greeks. They have the amphitheater, and they would have the characters. Please pay attention because we'll be talking about this afterward. Remember, I was studying TV and cinema for a while, and many of the things that I learned shocked me because they, I had a connection and understood. In the Greek theatrical arts, they have the characters, the personas, and they had the, and then they have types. They had dramas, comedies. So all those classifications that you see in the movies, we didn't invent them. They did. Okay, the characters had specific uh, types, like the villain. We didn't invent that concept. We'll talk about that a little bit after that. But they were the ones invented this. The Romans, when they invaded the Greeks, the Romans had a tradition. When they, they will conquer a, a nation, they will analyze, and all the good things that the nation had, they will adopt. So, oh, oh, you guys do this? That's a good. Yeah, and that's what made the Romans become so powerful. They will reject. Some things were very critical. You all have to speak Latin, no matter what. Although they absorbed a lot of the Greek culture, uh, also in that, but then the other things, and they came to the Greeks and said, Woo, we like this idea, entertainment. You know, bread and circus, that was the Roman philosophy. If we keep the people entertained with entertainment and give them food, they will not bother about what we do in the government. And it still works today. It still works today. Give them multimedia, and we can do whatever we want. So the Romans adopted the Colosseum. They had all those big uh, shows going on. And basically, this is where we got the idea for modern sports and from modern multimedia. Sorry, the animation is repeating itself there. For modern multimedia. So when theatrical arts were brought to the new world, initially, if you wanted to watch a play, and even for the movies, you usually will have to go to a saloon. What will happen in the saloon? Gambling, prostitution, uh, addictions, you know, alcohol, cigarette, all that. So Satan started saying, well, this is worldly enough, but I'm only reaching the worldly. 
right? I'm playing worldly things only for the worldly. We need this to be more popular. So it says, let's do this. Let's take these out of the saloons and bring it to houses of show. That's when we started seeing the theater. It is a place that you go just for entertainment. This is the same concept. You see, you don't find in Israel any place just to go there just for entertainment. This concept of entertainment by itself is like sugar isolated from the rest of the food. It's like sex out of the marriage. You can uh, want to isolate something is usually never healthy. So Satan said, okay, not, it's not any longer in the saloon, so people are now happy. Oh, we don't have to go to the saloon and all this shooting and all these things. We go to a place just for theater. But still there was a problem. Uh, now, one of the first plays that was, brought, one of the first movies that was brought, was first action movie, special effects movie, was The Arrival of the Train. I think it was the Lumiere brothers that produced this. Put the camera there and filmed the train arriving. It was very exciting. You will be surprised to know that people were not used to see images projected. And the people that were in the audience, they ran out when they saw the train because it looked like it was coming on top of them. It was something that they never saw. The, the projection itself works already on the lie. It works on the retina persistence. We have in our eyes, if I look at the light and close my eyes, I will still keep seeing the light. Your eyes creates a dragging effect from one image to the other. Otherwise, every time you will blink, you will lose sense of where you are. You know, I just blink, I lost the image. But your eyes will keep and maintain the image and drag it to the next section. Are you with me? That's why it's an illusion. A movie is, in fact, one photograph after a But it plays faster than your retina. Your, your eyes go like 24 frames per second. No, less than that. And a movie will play 24 frames or different rates. But what I'm trying to say, when you see those guys moving like this in the old movies, is because it's going in a different frame rate from your eyes that is not so natural. Okay, so 24 rates will be more or less what your eyes will go. But we are not going to go into this detail. What I'm trying to say is, those theatrical homes were... The theaters were projecting those movies and everything. First they would have plays, then they will play the movies. Now, if you were born an Adventist, or if you have been in the church for a long time, you know that a lot of the discussions we had is, can we go to the theater or not? Raise your hand if you had those discussions when you were younger, when it was in your, your old days. We are, we are kind of giving away our age, but, but still okay. So we had great, great discussions in the, in the church. And the devil is like, I like this. I like this. And I remember when I went to the art school and there was a group work, a homework that we had to do as a group, that we had to watch a movie. And I'm like, nope, I cannot go to the theater. And all my colleagues was like, why? I say, well, because I'm a Christian. It was so what? Uh, what has what got to do? Why can't you go? Well, because um, people smoke in the, in the cinema, in the movie theater. You say, you, you've never gone there, right? Because it's now forbidden to smoke in the... Oh, yeah, yeah you cannot? Oh, all right. Well, but people go there to court and, you know, to do up since... What? I mean, it's more expensive to go to the movies than to rent a motel. I mean, uh, and I'm like, when I ran out of excuses, they say, well... We don't want a bad grade. You have to come to the movies and we have to do this work. And I'm like, ooh, I'm going to be a big conscious battle. I was already turning a little bit worldly, but I still wanted to remain with some principles. So I decided to go and very carefully I'm entering there. I remember entering for the first time in a theater. And I'm looking around. Didn't see the devil anywhere. <laughs> Kept going. And until the end of the movie, the devil didn't show up, at least that I noticed. 
And it didn't take long until I became very addicted. I will watch like five movies, uh, especially on Monday, that it was cheaper and everything. So the devil knew that for a while people had a resistance with the place, but this was distracting them from the real problem, which was not the place, the content. So the devil say, okay, now we have the people coming to the theater, but some Adventists are still resisting. So here's what I'm going to do. If they are not coming to the theater, I'll take the theater to them. And the devil was so happy because those Adventists that will not come to watch one movie in the theater will rent five and take it home. He said, well, this is working much better. Oh, how didn't I think about this before? I'm sure you remember when we had those video clubs that you will go there and rent several, and we'll feel so kosher because, of course, and I remember we will sit like with my friends from youth, and we will have Coca-Cola contests because we had to keep awake to watch all those movies, so we buy liters and liters of coal and stuff. So you see, the devil is going down to the next step, and I want you to please notice the trend, because the devil doesn't boil a frog on the spot, <laughs> okay? He will take his time. He's very patient, okay? So I want you to understand how bringing TVs and movies to the home changed our life. The average American, this is in the 80s, they were spending 25 to 30 hours a day. By the time they will turn 80 years old, they had watched 15,000 hours of TV versus 11 hours at school. So who was really educating them? Now, why, Pastor, why are you bringing uh, statistics from the 80s? Yes. I want you to realize that they didn't have cell phones, they didn't have iPads, they didn't have computers. This was the amount. This is giving you an idea of how things are. At that time, you will have like one TV per house. And now you might have like, okay, per room, per, per pocket. All right, so let's leave it like that. The next step, the devil say, okay, yeah, it's not bad that they are renting those movies and bringing them home, but they will still take until the weekend to do that. I'm not happy. It's too much time with, without worldly things. So he says, I'm going to bring computers to the home because then they can download those movies and they can watch it every day. They don't have to go to the uh, video club or anything like that. And then he says, you know what? A desktop is good, but they still have to wait until the end of the day. What if we provide a laptop that they can take anywhere? So once in a while, they can open and flip the desktop and watch a movie. But then he says, you know what? It's still not enough. I want them to be able to, at any moment, pick up the phone and check. I don't know if you are aware that... Our discussion about movie theaters is absolutely ridiculous in the context of all we have evolved. While we were rejecting, it's now not seeming that bad. And we are far beyond that while discussing this problem. Are you with me? And now the devil said, well, we are bringing the big stuff to a small stuff, the small stuff to a stationary stuff, the stationary stuff to a portable stuff. We want them to go to the next level. A wearable is not only something you carry, it's something that you wear. And still he's not happy, although you can already watch movies on your watch, which if Ellen White will wake up now, poor she. But now he's saying we are going to the next level. I don't want something that you just wear. I want something that is inside of you. I don't know if you noticed this, but I've noticed this since I opened my Facebook account. When you come to Facebook, the first sentence that you see is, what's in your mind? That is Satan's greatest dream. And he is about to accomplish that. So what I'm trying to show you is the long way we came and what is really happening? Look, this is an industry that I'm 
fairly inside, and I've always been into this world. I don't know if you notice that phones are now reducing more and more the frame around your cell phone. Researchers have found out the effects. We'll talk about this when we talk about the effects. When you are in a movie theater, if everything is dark and you have only one source of flickering light, the flick flickering light has a benumbing effect on your frontal lobe and takes you to an alpha mode in two to 10 minutes. What happens now is in the alpha mode, your brain is constantly blocking the frontal lobe. But now we have these to be carried and they found out that the only thing that creates a blockage between that reality and the real reality is the frame around so they want to reduce it so that you are totally immersed because your cell phone is a flickering source of light. And as it is so little, or even if it's light around you, your focus vision will create the same effect as nothing else exists but this. And this has an hypnotic effect on your frontal lobe. It has the same effect as the beat song that we were talking this morning. The flickering light... It's another way to hypnotize somebody if you are flickering light. As the rate, we don't notice the refresh rate. We don't notice. We are being benumbed. I want you to notice and ask yourself this. Why do you think that, and I used to, when I left the publishing house, working with advertisement. I had a joint venture with advertisement. I have a passionate passion for advertising also. Why do you think that all TV advertisement is called the above the line? Below the line is like radio, uh, newspapers, magazines. Above the line is super expensive. All the above the line advertisement, they are all in command mode. Buy now. Drink this. Buy it tomorrow. Buy, no, tomorrow they don't say it's today. You have to buy today. It's because they know you are in half a mode. You are like you are hypnotized. So you're recording the commands and you will do it. Our brain is totally exposed. Now what happens with our generation today is that the enemy was able to bring those things and get me wrong, God can use those things. But I do believe that we all have to admit that at this moment the devil is taking much more advantage of this than God. If you notice, and I'm not criticizing, I'm just showing the reality it got to them because they were already born in a generation of computers while we were not. But the youth, they came from computers to all these devices. And if you notice, our youth is benumbed. Benumbed. They don't realize you can, there's an author, I'm, I'll mention him, is Simon Sinek. He talks about the way people are blocked with these devices. It's an addiction. You have to pull it out. So it says some people cannot even work if they don't have the cell phone nearby them. They cannot do anything. They don't realize, but there's a dopamine addiction and many other addictions, a visual addiction. And what happens is that you need that doses. You are needing that doses uh, regularly. So the question is, what are the effects that this has? Until this part, I think it's all in English. But now it starts in, Portuguese, in uh, Spanish. Okay? Uh, in Matthew 6, 22, it says that the lamp of the body is the eye. And we all know this text. If your eye is not good, then your body will not good. And in 2 Corinthians 3, 18, it says that by beholding, we are transformed. Let me ask you this. If you are transformed by beholding, how much more will you be transformed by beholding while hypnotized? Are you with me? And Matthew 6.22. And now it's 2 Corinthians 3.18. This is a very important uh, text. But now, my friends, we are not really just with media. Media is old days. We are entering virtual reality and I want us to understand the problems of this. So this lecture goes a, a lot into this. We are coming to a world, you know, uh, Zelensky had a fake 
um, video that I put about him telling the Ukrainians to give up. No one could tell if it was him or not. Because reality, you know, uh, what's the name of that app or the fake, um, deep fake, you know, reality is becoming so critical that you cannot even use a video now a, a source as a source of evidence because it can be altered and it's very hard to tell. They also have devices that you can speak one sentence to the device. The device will record your word, will understand your modulation of voice, your breathing and everything, and you can write whatever text you want and the device will reproduce with the exact intonation and accent that you have. You know that Mark Zuckerberg, they did a video, a deep fake video with him using the two techniques and put him saying that Facebook sucks and all these kind of things and talking badly about Facebook. So what I'm trying to say is we are coming to a point that we don't know any longer what is real and what is not real. Who is the father of lies? Uh, this was the, the thing that I was talking about. So I want us to understand, this is Simon Sinek. I don't recommend all that he says. Uh, he's a thinker, a philosopher, a modern. But he has a video, an interview that he talks about millennial generation and how they cannot work. He says, this example, he says, I have somebody, this guy is new at the job, and we are there. And uh, after two weeks, this guy is coming and say, I want to quit. And I say, why do you want to quit? Because I mean, I'm not getting to the goals. I'm not getting there. It's not working. And I'll tell you, you are only here for two weeks. I mean, for you to get somewhere, you, you should take at least six months, a year. People are using quick fixes, you know, you see people getting depressed because they don't have so many likes with one post. Some people get, may go to, to commit suicide because of one post. Because we don't realize, and he says that, the effect that the people are having as a refuge on social media is the same impact that people, when they came from Vietnam, they were immersing in alcohol. The only problem is that alcohol, everybody knew was bad, but these people are not aware. Social media looks like a very simple thing. The Bible tells us if, if your right eye, this is Matthew 5, 29, uh, makes you sin, that you should take it out. I'm sure you know that Jesus was not recommending, it might be an ultimate um, need, but he was not really recommending that you plug your eye. I think it's easier to plug the TV. Now, a lot of people say, yeah, it's not bad in itself if you can control yourself. That's exactly why I don't have it. Because I'm still to see the guy that can control himself. Okay, so we are going now to the next part. So we had a little bit of a sneak peek of the history. And I'm, I'm uh, talking about that. We're going to the effects. And we are going to now see the effects that he might have with us. Sorry, let me probably come out of the... I'm trying to use one and the other to get you the best of two worlds. So... Let's go here. We're going to talk about the plot and what is called semiotics. It's two things that are very important in any movie. Now we are entering the effects. And this might be some of the things that you really don't think they are there. You might think, oh, the problem is watching violence on TV or something like that. Okay? The plot is the structure of the story. And all stories, they go in the same. Let me give you an old example. If you were a kid and you will watch Popeye, you know that in the beginning is being bitten up and then suddenly he eats the spinach and he becomes so strong. You know who I'm talking about? Okay, good, because everybody was looking at me like I'm... It's an American thing. Yeah, millennials don't know. I'm, I'm talking to the old generation with this example. But millennials, they know this. If you're watching a movie about slavery, first you see this black guy being so... Uh, they, they do so many unrighteous things to him that you start raising anger in your heart. I mean, the guys are really bad to him. He's beaten up and everything. 
they take you to the point, you know that people that write the movie plots, they are psychologists now. It's not just a writer. They study all your psychology, all the things in the movie, from the opening, from the music, you know, that's why the song goes tan 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 and then he goes and you and then suddenly go you're like okay the guy is persecuting the other guy they drive your emotions you find yourself crying like crazy and then laughing i mean if somebody was recording you without telling anybody you were watching a movie Right? So the same thing goes with the plot. First, they justify sin. Okay? Is this guy is a nice guy? Greets all the neighbors. Sometimes goes there and surprise moles their, their yard and everything. He's a nice guy. And then he arrives home and his house is burned. His car was stolen. His wife was raped. His daughter was killed. And now we are like outrage. And he has to do something. This is not fair. And here he goes, the only thing that survived from the incident, it was a gun that he had there, you know, and he goes out and starts chasing the guys, you know who they were, and kills one. And you say, yeah, yeah, got it. Kills the next one, yeah, three more to go. Look, are you noticing how you're changing your behavior? And then he goes to the in, and he's looking at the guy, gets the gun, and he shoots him first. And you're like, yeah, it was not bad. But that guy died, he didn't even suffer. After all, you notice the things we start saying? Before they justify adultery, you will see that the woman is suffering. This is the way plots work. They are shifting paradigm for you to agree. I'm going to give you a last example that I always give. It was a movie that I watched a long time ago. I'm not recommending. Uh, Robert De Niro, you know, an old actor. He was coming dressed as a thief. He comes nearby a place, pulls his mask. He has a little machine, he goes, <laughs> the machine goes with a hook, gets to the window, you start going up and you hear that song. <laughs> and he gets there, he has another machine on the pocket, he takes it out, <laughs> he opens the window, <laughs> and he enters. <laughs> <laughs> Music has always to be there, right? And he goes and there's a safe, and he has another machine that reads combinations. <laughs> Opens the safe and we're like, chum, 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 chum. And as he opens the safe, there's a lot of money in there. And we're like, this guy's gonna be rich. And he starts chum, 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 chum. and we're like, yeah, yeah. And suddenly we use taps. Oh, somebody's coming. He's looking around and the song changes again. He looks at the couch, jumps behind the couch, somebody opens the door, turns the light on. Mm, 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 mm. <laughs> and he's coming and he's moving. He said, Hey, the safe is open. <gasps> and he looks, the window is open. I didn't leave the windows open. He goes to the window, but the sofa is nearby the window, and the thief is there hiding. And you know, oh no, he's gonna get him. He's gonna get him. <laughs> Let's start the movie. So, are you defending the thief? Who, who is the other guy? We don't know. His one is Robert De Niro. He's the hero. So even if he's robbing, we are with him. You see, if it was your house, which side would you be taking? You see how your, your, your concept of what is right is totally changed. My friend, the same techniques are being used now with documentaries. Don't be illusionate that you're just watching the lion after the gazelles. Those are plotted now. They go the same concepts. They create an entire plot, and you are dragging the same concepts, okay? The Greeks invented this with the tragedy, comedy, and satirists. But now I want to tell you about personas and semiotics. Those character things will apply to all that you do and see. And we have typical... Character traits, you know, the protagonist, the antagonist, the naive, the juvenile, all the movies and all the things we watch, they carry the same thing. Why, why am I saying this? You will understand. Because of this next thing. I'm, I'm not going to talk about subliminal messages and everything. 
I'm not going to talk about indirect messages. It's a very, very important topic. Please pay very much attention, especially if you have children. This is critical. When I came across this information, I was at awe. I was really shocked. Semiotics was a technique developed by the Greeks that the Russians took and really took it to the next level, which is they defined the typical characters in a plot. So you have the plot that has to go a certain psychological way, and then there are typical characters, the villain, the hero, and some typical characters. Now, those typical characters, they will interact with our perceptions, and I want to bring something to help you understand what I'm saying. If you hear Jesus telling a parable, Jesus will say, there was this, uh, this man, the father of a household, he had a son, and his son went to a distant land to rescue his brethren. Who do you think about when I talk you, tell you about this? Who is the father? Who is the son? Who is the one that is going to say? Your brain has something that is called similitude, which will identify the things and make parallels. I will talk about similitude more, but I want to use this in the context of uh, semiotics. So similitude is this. They did a research. They were researching with monkeys, and every time the monkey will get a peanut, the bell will ring. <clears throat> And he will know that he will eat the peanut and be happy. His brain was connected to the electroencephalograph, and he was registering. Now, as they finished the experiment, the guys, the scientists, came to grab the peanut. And when the guy grabbed the peanuts, the monkey rang like if he was eating the peanuts. Because he was identifying that what he's doing is the same thing that when I do, it gives me pleasure. We have the same thing. If I ask you to do this, can you do this, please? Yes, sister. If I ask you to do this, your brain is able to identify that's his eye, that's his eyebrow. I have a similar thing. When, I do this, when he does this, I have to move these muscles to do this. This is similitude. This gets even worse when we go to video games, we think that when we watch video games, it's just a character there, but for your brain, whatever that guy is doing, your brain is doing and thinking it's you. The guy that is killing people there, your brain is not taking it like if it was him. He is feeling like it's you. That's why some of the games, you don't even have a character showing up. It's just like if you were seeing it. We will talk about that. But what I want to tell you is this. So these typical characters that you find in a parable or so, your brain will identify and make parallels. And I want to tell you how Satan has been taking away generations and generations of Christians by using this technique, doing what I call a reverse engineering with semiotics. I'm going to ask you to do this. You know the biblical prophetic symbols, right? What is a woman in the Bible? A church. What is a prince in the Bible? Who is the prince? Jesus, most likely. Okay, very good. What is clothing in the Bible? Righteousness. Very good. You, you see, it's very simple. What if I use this in a story and use the characters and do reverse engineering with those plots? So now... I want you to go with me and look at some stories in this way. Let's say we have Cinderella. Okay, old stories. Cinderella is a woman. What is a woman? She has no dress. What is a dress? To meet the prince. Who is the prince? Cam's a good witch. Who is the witch? Witchcraft belongs to who? Is it good? Is there such a thing as good witches? No. That is going to help her. So a satanic force is going to help her to have a dress, which is righteousness. Is there her dress? Is a real dress? No. 
It's a fake righteousness. She goes to the party. Are we going to have a party when we meet the prince? Yes. At midnight. Who will come at midnight? Jesus. When the prince is coming to meet the church, what happens? She has no righteousness. Are you me? Let me go to another one. Snow White. Is she a boy or a girl? A girl. What is a woman? A church. What is a snow white church? Pure church. She lives with seven dwarfs. What is a dwarf? Someone that didn't grow to the full stature of Christ. How many peers of the church are there? How many dwarfs? What is the last period of the church? Laodicea, sleeping church. What is the last dwarf? Are you with me? You teach one thing to kids at church, then they watch all those things and do those connections and destroy all. And I could go on and on because they apply semiotic techniques with reverse engineering, destroying all the symbols of the Bible. Okay? So I could go with all those stories you will know because they are using similitude, figures of similitude. This is about the monkey situation that I was telling you about. Okay? So I want to, I told you about the De Niro thing. You might say this doesn't affect me. But that's not what statistics said. When Fast and the Furious first came up, they did a search. 70% of the people that will come out of the movies will come out squealing their wheels. <laughs> Did you notice what happened to the cars? Everybody was going nitro. Yeah. Right? It was not the movie. It was not the movie. If I would call anybody here, almost any of us, even some of our kids, unfortunately, and I give you a air blower or something like that, and I will say, just pretend this is a gun. Most of us, we will know exactly what to do. We will know how we hold a gun. We'll know how we enter someplace. We'll know how we bang the door, how we stay beside the door, how we pull the gun, how we switch the recharge. Have you gone to go for shooting training, sister? How do you know this? Because your brain has been beholding while in hypnotized mode. You know all about it. Let me tell you this. Did you know that Bravik, that guy that killed 70 people there in Europe, never touched a gun, only trained in video games? If video games are not so realistic, why would the army train with video games? Because it's giving you a sense of reality. To, to start up with, I don't know why people still go to the store it says, this product may cause epilepsy, and if you notice any symptom, go straight away to the doctor. I don't know, but if I would go to the supermarket, and I'm going to get some biscuits, and you say, like, this product can cause you epilepsy, and if you notice any symptoms, go to the doctor. I'll say, well, yeah, I'll take it anyhow, just in case. Will you do that? I don't know. Something is weird here. So, friends, I'm just going to jump those examples. I want to go to the nuts and bolts, because now I want to talk a little bit about the final strikes that we are seeing in our world today. Let me just get to the place there. Uh, first, I want to I explain just this. I'm, I'm using several parts in the lecture. It's one of the things in the health message that is very clear is the work of the frontal lobe as the center of command of your being. These work to you be as a what? A sign in your, between your frontals, right? Between your eyes, in your frontal, and on your hand. A lot of us, we are aware that the same thing will happen here and in what we do. So the mind representing what we think and the hands representing what we do, right? Are you with me? Where will the mark of the beast be? A microchip in the neck, right? No? Where? 
forehead. Thank you. Satan says, God says, I'm going to put my sign on your forehead and on your hand. Satan says, I want to put my mark on your forehead or on your hand. Are you with me? The forehead is how you think. The hand is what you do. Satan is not concerned if you think well as far as you do wrong. You get the mark. Are you? Please follow me. Satan is not concerned if you do right, but you think wrong. You get the mark. Both ways go. As far as one of them is rejecting. Please follow me. Pharisees were doing good things, but the way they were thinking about it was wrong. Were they from Jesus? Most likely not. Many of us believe this is wrong. This is wrong. But we practice differently. Please follow me. We believe lust is wrong, but we don't mind sitting and watching a movie about lust. We believe lying is wrong, but we don't mind watching a plot that is all fake. The Bible says all that is real, all that is truth, but we don't mind. So we are creating a parallel that is very complex. I want you to understand this. While you watch a movie or media, especially the internet, it becomes even worse because, for instance, in the past, pornography was a magazine problem. Today, pornography is a flickering image problem. So it's two addictions in one. It's very hard to overcome because you have the pornography addiction and the screen addiction. So when you're watching your front that makes the, the decision as a power of discernment is now but when you're watching adventure, you're watching romance, all this is stimulating your thalamus and epithalamus that are producing, helping producing hormones. So it's like you're feeding the carnal part and blocking the spiritual part. Are you with me? I want you to understand this. Please pay very much attention to this part. Many of us Adventists, we are taking the fooling pill of the devil. We are, we are aware of Sunday law. Raise your hand. When Sunday law comes, you want to follow Sunday. Ooh, nobody. So we should be safe. But we don't understand that Sunday and Saturday is not a matter of days, it's a matter of who is the Lord. If you choose one Lord, you will get His mark. If you choose the other Lord, you will get His ceiling. I want you to understand that Sunday law is not the beginning of a process, but the end of a process. It's the process of the character that is being built in your mind. If your mind has the character of Christ, the character will be the law of God. Thou shalt not kill, Thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not steal. If you are drinking and engraving in your mind the opposite of the character of God is the counterfeit of the law of God. So Satan will show you adultery, lie, lust. Are you with me? Whatever you're engraving in your frontal lobe, when the two lords come, they will look at your frontal lobe what they see there will decide if you will get a seal or a mark. Satan is eluding us with the idea that later on we will decide. You know, diet never starts on Monday. If it's going to start, it starts now. If you say Monday, it's not going to start. Are okay for one day in the future. But we are okay for today to decide for the movie. To decide for the song. To decide for the food. But one day we'll decide for Christ. We are feeding ourselves. That's like the guy. Every day everybody's saying, so you're going to have a driving license exam uh, next week. Have you practiced? Nah, it's, I mean, I've seen a lot of people driving. Just put their hands on the wheel. Engage, drive. And I mean, that's nothing there. Just click the clutch. Not the clutch, the, the paddle. And uh, you should be fine. Is this guy going to pass the exam? That's what we are doing. 
Uh, Sunday law? No, for Jesus, for Jesus. Well, I'm not for Jesus with my plate today, but for Jesus on that day. I'm not for Jesus. Are you with me? So I want you to understand that we are feeding the carnal part and uh, blocking the other part. We receive rewards when we do that, for instance, on a video game. And they have made researches that show that what happens when you are doing this kind of virtual reality, starting with video games, but all kind of virtual reality, what happens is that the part of your brain that is controlling reality start mingling with the fantasy. I, I remember when I was a kid, I would watch American movies and feel like, man, that's so fake. Because he had nothing to do with the European police. I came to US, I was like, I felt like I was watching movies every time. First time I was stopped, we were there at Wildwood, I'm stopped by the police, this guy was with a lantern and a gun and everything. And I said, what did I do? It was just a regular stop. I'm like, woo. I felt like I was in the movies. I believe people watch so many movies, they start taking this to the real life. You know, we start applying this. So your brain started mixing reality with fantasy. Have you noticed that people that are addicted to video games that are now on their 50s, they have no sense of responsibility. They cannot take care of their families because they lost sense of consequence. Because in the video game, <laughs> kill, game over, restart. But life is not like that. But your brain is learning that if something bad happens, it's not the end of the world. You can always have a game over and start again. That's not life. So friends, I want to bring you now to the last thing that I want to talk today. Let me just find it here. So this is the guy that I was telling you. He never used any, any gun. Yeah, something is wrong with our world. But we should not try again. I want to I want to bring one last thing. We are on the verge of all this metaverse thing, but I want you to really know what is happening in the world. So you saw all the trend and evolution of multimedia, right? You saw the idea. We started with theaters. They became home theaters. They became computers, laptops, mobile devices, portable devices, and now internal devices. You know, they say we're going to be much better if we have a computer chip in our head. And I'm not saying that's the mark of the beast. I'm just saying that is the interaction between the machine and the person. But I don't know if you heard about machine learning. Have you heard this expression? You never heard this expression, machine learning in artificial intelligence. Thank you. Machine learning is computers before they were programmed. You program them, they do this. Now computers are taught to analyze data and learn. For instance, they have personal companions that it's a robot. When you get the robot, the robot is neutral. But he starts seeing your person, if you're jokey, if you're what, and he starts learning and mimicking, he starts learning. In fact, computer learning or machine learning is what Google does or Facebook or any social media. They start reading how you behave, oh, you go through this kind of images and you watch for this long at this time, so I'm going to do more of this and take you to one direction or another. The computer is learning with all the data that he's receiving. And we are on the verge of metaverse and there's a big fight for this. Whenever there's a fight for something, believe me, there's a lot coming. Uh, Microsoft, I don't know if you were aware of this, but the pandemic was kind of very convenient because when the pandemic happened, it was exactly when all these companies were buying uh, shares or companies. Microsoft invested a lot. Google has a part that is all for this in artificial intelligence. So it was very convenient. We had to stay at home for two years and they really need those machines now. And we can test them. So they're developing machines that you don't need to go to the doctor. We can be with you connected and stay at home. You don't need to go to school. We can have a hologram that will be nearby you and will teach you. And it's like the guy is there with you and you are interacting with him. Now, I want you to understand this. For instance, in the promo, they said, we, with those voices, you know, those promotional voices. 
the world is changing. We are bringing before you a new reality. And they talk, we're gonna, you have a paradigm shift and everything, and you're like, oh, so good. We're gonna, oh, this is going to be the, uh, you know, uh, they have something that is called preemptive programming, which is ahead of time, they tell you what they are going to do, and you start getting used to it. You know, when they, some years ago, issued the movie A.Y. with uh, Will Smith, you know, uh, the movie was already telling you what we're going to do next. I don't know if you remember. In the old movies, when they will have Zoom calls, you remember that? And everybody, wow, talk to the phone. And everyone, woo, this is so much in the future. Welcome to the future. We are there now. Okay? So they are showing us all those things. And one of the advertisements uh, shows something very interesting. This lady has a work to do. We are almost done, okay? I'm getting to my point here. This lady has a work to do. And she's like, I don't want to do this by myself. So she calls the friends. And through virtual uh, reality, those friends form holograms beside her. So the three of them are having now a meeting. And they are talking about what they're going to do. And then a 3D shape, you know, in AR thing, is formed in the middle of them. They can both, the three of them can interact where they are. I think we should change this here and do it like this and like that. And they are doing all that and all seeing and they approve. In another one, they traffic control and they have a cyborg. You see that one? Sophia. Sophia is an European cyborg and each one, Japan has one, America has one. They have several of those. They have machine learning. You can interview them. They don't program what they say. They learn with time what they say. And they can have a talk and crack jokes like if they were a human being. So Sophia is there. This guy here is a virtual reality. That's the real person there. And there's the cyborg. And the three of them are making a decision about traffic um, control. So Sophia, Ameka, they all have machine learning, which is they were programmed not to with a final programming, but they were programmed to learn by association with humans. So the more they see us, the more they know how to react. If you type Sophia on YouTube, you will see her sitting and smiling and laughing. And you, the, you, they bring them to new people. They ask them whatever they want. It's not a pre-program. Have you called Apple or Amazon and you have these guys saying, I am a machine, but I can interact like if I was a human. You can tell me whatever you want and I will answer to you. Please tell me what you did. And say, you can even test them and say, talk very randomly. Oh, I would like to see, I have a problem with my hard drive. Uh, did I understand well? You have a problem with your hard drive. What is the problem? Is it a technical problem or a, another solution with data? And you're answering and talking to the guy. And we got used to these kind of machines in such a way that we have now for the kids. Moxie is one for the kids. And it works like this. The, the advertisement, you see the kid very sad there. And mom and dad look at each other and say, poor him. We got to get him a friend. They go get him a Moxie. And Maxi comes, Maxi comes and goes to him. Hello, what's your name? And the kid says his name and says, I, I want to be your friend. And the kid is talking to him and then he says, is everything okay in school? And he says, yeah, no, also this guy is bullying you. Let's see what we can do here. And then they are talking and interacting. I don't know if you are understanding this. This is the, what I was talking about, virtual reality. I don't know if you are, I'll soon explain this. I don't know if you are understanding this. Preemptive programming is first showing this in the movies, then preparing you to live with it. We were not used to talk to these machines, but now everybody talks to Siri, everybody talks to Alexa, everybody talks to them, and little by little it's like, we talk to them like they are human. I have to confess something, it's a public confession. I feel bad when I ask something to Siri and others say, please. Siri, could you call my wife, please? And my wife even told me, you don't have to tell her, please. I say, I feel bad. <laughs> it's, it's not polite. <laughs> okay. You might think that the goal is just that we are just used to talk to machines, but it's not. Only. Ask one of those machines, are you track dadding me? And you will see what he will answer. He will not answer it. 
The last thing I want to talk about is the 7D reality and the holographic reality, which is really growing. You will see where I'm going with this. So with this artificial intelligence, I wanted to see from where we came, okay? We came from those movies flickering there. People were watching and discussing if we should go to the theater or not. This is where we are. Are you with me? In some, some later years. So uh, 7D is an evolving of 3D. It's a multi-projection light, and that's an evolving of what we would have as hologram. I remember one day I came, I think it was the Texas airport or something, and I'm coming there, and there's, there's a flight attendant hologram, really kind of fakish. and said, welcome to Texas, and this and that. And, and I'm like, okay, that's nice. But we are not talking about this. These are holographic billboards that are projected in big cities. You have also some in, in, in New York, I believe. Those ones are in Japan. And we are going to a different, different world. And what you're seeing here is a holographic 7D projection. So you see those kids in the gym, and what you're seeing there, it's a projection that is so realistic because it's a multi-facet projection that the key the water splashes, the kid even does like this because it looks like it's coming against them. And if you type 70, you'll be shocked with the kind of things that are happening. It's virtual reality with augmented reality mixed with a 3D and holographic thing. All is coming together. My point is this, so more images from 7D. My point is this, using this holographic technique and the 7D technique, People are now making concerts with those that were gone. So Michael Jackson had a concert. The dancers are real people, and he is a hologram. The songs were part of what he was recording before he died, mixed with what the computer recognized, his voice, and he's able to modulate and add and finish the product. And people are paying Millions to go and watch a concert, a live concert. They did the same thing with Whitney Houston, Tupac. So we are coming to the point that not only people cannot tell what is real or what is not, as people are not concerned. Because reality is subjective. If it is your reality, if it is for you, I don't know if you are aware that what the metaverse is. If you think internet was a problem, forget internet. Internet is something from the past. Now you're not watching something. You're not a spectator. You're going to dive in. At this moment, as we talk, there are people buying properties on the metaverse. You pay big sums to get a... Now, they are a parallel reality. For instance, you may have this property may belong to you in real life, but in the metaverse, it's still for somebody bought it. So you can buy that property and feel you have metaverse wealth, and you can use a cryptocurrency to buy the property. You can be a millionaire in the virtual world, even if you don't have money in the real world. And you are holding property, and you have right and registration for it, and there's an entire world, you can mix your home, reality, augmented reality can get a scanner of this home uh, to LIDAR, LIDAR, or LIDAR, or they call it, and, and you read the home and mix, and you say, now I want to have, uh, you know, Alice in the Wonderland tree in here, and you put it there, you can dress wherever you want, and it's your world. You don't have to face reality at the end of the day, no matter how hard was your day. You can come home, immerse the metaverse, and be the guy you want to be, whoever you want to be there. So it's not just a fake selfie when you're not really at the gym. It's not just a fake selfie when this is not really what you're eating. It is a fake life. Fake life. You are living a parallel life and you become addicted to it. You enter a world where you, nobody knows who you are, not even yourself. My question is, I want to ask you this question very clearly. If you see this strategy, this all thing, and if you read what the Spirit Prophet tells us about the last days, how demons will manifest themselves among us, 
I want to ask you this. Who can tell if what you're seeing is a 7D hologram or a seance demon that is showing before you? First, if you try to learn anything, drawing, painting, whatever you find, 3D, whatever you find on the internet is always monsters and demons and ogres and weird things, you know, vampires. People are okay with that. All the movie industry is totally spiritualized. We're seeing dinosaurs, avatars, and we think this is fantasy, but you know that avatar was a vision that somebody had in the past. You were, it was you that was sharing that. I didn't even know that thing. Avatar is a vision that somebody had in the past. Even the movie The Passion, you know, it's a vision of a nun. So all of these things are not coming just by accident. So people are used to this. They have no problem. They are not concerned because they don't even believe in demons. They are totally open to all this. And if you come to them and tell them this is a demon, they will laugh at your face. You don't know what is technology. This is a 7D hologram. And we are just seeing the beginning of this. This industry will be perfected to the point like they do in some things with multiple devices that you can smell, touch, and you can be so totally immersed with this. You know that Apple has been taking so long to release the AR glasses and uh, the VR glasses because they really don't want to fail with this. All the big guys with the big money are all invested into this. Do you think it's because they want to make it better for us? I do believe from the bottom of my heart that Satan has been working hard into these projects, leading mankind to these ultimate multimedia stuff where reality will cross together and we cannot tell what is what. We are about to enter a world that we have never seen before. And that's why the Bible says, when the Lord comes, will he find faith on earth? We are to enter a world at this moment. We cannot tell what is fake news and what is not. If somebody issues now a message from the president, if there's no fact, it was a fake message, none of us will know. It can be whatever, it can be a 3D. You know that has been working on this. You know, for instance, the Matrix that was now just released, you know that the majority of the movie is not really the actor. It's all 3D. We are coming to a world that there's no way to say. And I envision people interacting with this reality, even Adventists, and they don't make a distinction between a demonic manifestation and a holographic manifestation. It doesn't matter. This is the world we are in. So I want you to really be careful and watch what you watch. And that's why I'm bringing this reality before you. Because I was talking about the preemptive programming. I tried to surf all the topics here. I talk about also the artificial intelligence as they're getting uses, used to this. I want you to realize that we are coming to that moment. That reality is totally lost. And if we, you know, the Spirit of Prophecy says that if we were not going through the Bible and the Word, when family members will show up, it will be so real that it will be hard to believe. Now, when I was a kid, and when we will say that Satan will simulate the coming of Jesus, our so naive minds will be thinking that the test will be, oh, but we know he's not going to touch the ground. That's such a hard test, isn't it? Am I touching the ground now? Am I touching the ground now? So this is what will fool Christians? This reality, Satan is absolutely able. There are Japanese projections that they put a plane on the air just with projections. It's not a real plane. Satan is perfectly able to create whatever kind of second coming he wants. If you keep trusting your senses, you will be deceived. Because you won't be able to tell what is the truth and what is not. If you keep feeding the life decisions you make by the way you feel, 
by what He causes you in sensations, you will be deceived. Because we are about to enter, in, to enter a world that we have never seen before. We have to trust what is written and know what is written so that the Holy Spirit may bring it to our minds. So friends, I tried to summarize. I didn't go too much into the effects on the frontal lobe, how it is a benumbing effect. There's a lot of content that you find about that. I wanted to bring you to this reality. We don't know the world we are getting in, and this is not the world that we know. None of us know it because they are also testing. There's this guy that used to be an engineer from Google, and he says, if you want my piece of advice, get out of all these things as fast as you can because those guys, they don't know what they are doing, and the ethics behind it are totally lost. We are playing around with things that we don't even understand. It's like these genetic manipulations that we started getting in. We don't know what we are playing. We are like kids playing with the socket thinking they are in control. So my encouragement for you is that you may be watchful. Amen. Communion with the Lord is protection and power. Okay, I'm going to really open a very short brief if you have any question or doubt, and then we will have a special song and we will close. It's very brief. If there was anything that was not clear, I think we had enough of question and answers with the music topic. And this one I didn't dig too much from the information I have there, but something might not be clear. Any question or anything? Yes, sister. Good question, how we deprogram. Now, I want to say this. We are in the world, although we are not from the world. I have a computer, I have an iPad, and I have a cell phone. It's hard to live out of this world. We didn't come here by chariots, although maybe we should. Uh, I, I'm, I'm saying this, it looks funny, but maybe we should spend more time with the Mennonites. Just saying, just saying. But the question is, most likely we are not able to control those things because these are machines. They process data and there's no way we can put up to that. I used to be very immersed in Facebook. I still have my Facebook account, but... In fact, my wife just, we had a joint Facebook account and she just decided to take it over again and each one takes his account because I was very lousy with my account also, you know. We keep that because of the ministry. But I will say the counsel that Jesus said, if your eye is causing you to scandal, cut it off. Most of the addicts and the addictions, they always think that they are about to control the thing. Are you with me? So the more you take your life in a normal level, the better. So I'm not saying you cannot go to Facebook and you'll find the devil there. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is that those things, look, sorry to say this, something that requires that you look at it, it's an impulse to look at it every five minutes, it's an addiction. And the, the thing that we do the most is this. I mean, this is persecution. It's like, zzz, 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 zzz. I don't need to know at any moment that you're writing me. I can do that when I have time. People don't even work. There are some companies that don't allow you to bring your cell phone exactly because people cannot work. They work like this. There's no multitasking. Your brain doesn't multitask. It goes quickly here and come back here and quickly here. You're draining your brain. Most of the things that we consume, they are really consuming us. Most of the things we think we are controlling, they are really controlling us. I would recommend a documentary. Um, what was the name of that? Social Dilemma. You will only find it on Netflix, so I use somebody's Netflix account. But I really recommend you watch that documentary with your kids. Social Dilemma. It, it explains. So I think it's a decision. I think the world is being dragged into a different kind of reality. And the more we abstain from that, 
without being weirdos or nerds that are. But I would rather be a saved nerd than a lost wise man. Okay? I hope I answered that. Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, going back to media, to movies, um, how would you recommend to help like uh, a, a young person, a te teenagers, to have parameters when it comes to movie watching besides watching some documentaries and some um, animal stuff? Um, I know by the presentation, you, it, I'm understanding that most of the movies and most of the videos, whatever genre they are, they, they say they are, are not safe enough for, for us to see. But is there any other parameters that we can help them so that they can see some? It's, this is a very difficult question, but a very important one. Um, first, I want to explain this. All programs, whether documentaries, movies, cartoons, whatever you think, that are based in the system of a plot and with the characters of semiotics, they are conditioning. Madonna was in uh, Larry King, and Larry King was saying, people say you don't let your daughter watch TV, and she said, no, she's not even going to watch this interview. And Madonna gave some links to websites that explain the effects of devices on children under three years old. I learned that with Madonna. And I'm like... So you're selling this to everybody, but you know, and you're not going to trap your daughter into that. You know, people say that Steve Jobs, their kids will not have access to the devices. And Ellen White has a text that says that Satan will use all kinds of devices. Of course, he was writing about something else, but it's interesting. All kinds of devices to trap us. So I want to first give this recommendation. The later you start your kids into these, or if you don't start, the better. Second, don't go like in a direct opposition. Try to distract them from their addiction. What happens with a kid is this, and many of the kids that sometimes are hyperactive, you know, HDD or whatever you call it, it's, it's what is it? Yeah. yeah. I didn't grow up with, I, I mean, in my time, there was no such a thing as those diseases. Well, what are you talking about? Everybody knows that kids are a little bit active, but what is this? This is people that spend a lot of time in front of devices, hypnotized and fed with hormones and emotions, overloaded with energy, but stop still. When they come out of the hypnotic state, they have a lot of accumulated energy and they don't know what to do. And when this becomes a vicious cycle, that's how they become like that. We created this. Okay? We made mistakes. I preached this for a long time, since 2004, as I said. And my older kids were already at a certain age that we thought they could watch some programs well-selected. But we didn't realize that my younger one was not at the age still. And we noticed the effect that that will have in him. Okay? So I think the later, or even if you don't start them into that, develop in them other things. Because those devices will totally kill interest for reading, interest for anything else, any physical activity. They will always find it boring. They will always, yeah, yeah, yeah. They might stay an entire day beside the screen, but going outside and playing is boring. You have seen those cartoons that the old mom saying to the kids, come inside, it's time to come inside. And now the new mom's telling the kids, go outside, it's time to go outside. What has changed? The second thing is if they have started trying to create a process, the alternative is not Christian movies. The alternative is other kind of activities that will require better reaction, beta reaction, that will re require interaction. If you feed them with that, that they will lose the interest because those things, they are so hypnotic that there's no way. For us it is, for them it is, you will grab them. And they will not have a discernment to say no to those things now. They compare this addiction to alcohol addictions. Our youth is mostly addicted. 
and even not only the youth. It's an addiction. This is addictive. I have battles with YouTube, and I use YouTube only for research. You know, I hear preachings. My kids were playing around with me because I hear all, all the things I hear on YouTube is three times speed up, sped up. So I'm like, learning, learning, learning. But still, I have to watch myself because it's something that drags into you. I have to try to play with the machine because if I click this or scroll over it, the data is registering, you know, and the next thing I'm getting those things that I don't want to get. So, <sighs> sister, I know it might sound a little bit negative, but I don't believe there's an easy solution for this. Deep in my heart, if I have to be sincere before you, I think our entire society is going to be dragged into a big hole. And this is the, the adults that our kids will have to deal with if they are not those kids those adults. So I only think if we don't put some little radical decisions on that, it's very hard to detach from this. Okay, so your daughters are still in a very young age. Please protect them from that as far and as much as you can. We have, just closing this before I go to the Elisa, we have a, a friend in London, he's a pastor in London, he studied with me in Spain, he had his daughter homeschooled. Suddenly they had some plans to go and buy a property in the countryside and move. And they decided to put her in school just for a year to speed up the process and the mom could work and make some money. In less than a year, she started feeling so jealous of all the devices that the colleagues had, all the things they were consuming that she was never having. The brainwash was happening there. She laid out an accusation against the parents that they were abusive. One day, mommy was coming to get her from school. She was arrested on the spot. They went home and arrested that. This is a pastor. He studied with me in school. We know that. My, daughter, my wife took care of the daughter. And now they are going through a legal process. We've been praying for that for more than a month. Finally, the police allow them to watch, to see the daughter. They are going to a deep legal process, all because it was too much for her, a new reality that she was not acquainted to. So we have to be prudent with this, but protect your kids as much as you can. I have no doubt that Satan is using those means to destroy the last resources. And that's why the Bible says, when I have come, will I find faith on earth? He's destroying us totally. Look at the society. Look at our youth. Totally destroyed. So protect your daughters and ask the Lord for wisdom. Give them a lot of alternatives, projects that they can be involved and do something productive. There's not too much more that I can say. For when the guys that are the engineers behind those things are saying, get out of it and are getting out of it themselves, and Madonna is saying, I'm not doing that, I think only if the devil will come and say, yeah, I did that. There's not too much more to say. Lisa. quick personal um, experience I had um, as a mother of three daughters, your days are busy. And so, you know, when I would put them down to sleep, I would think of, oh, it's me time now. I can watch something that I want to watch on television. And I got into this series on Netflix and it was late one night and I was trying to, you know, trying to fit in like a few episodes. And then I heard the voice of God say, I cannot watch this with you. If you want me to be near you, I can't watch this. And I literally heard that voice. I can't watch this with you. And so I use that now on everything. If I can't listen to this song with you, I can't watch this with Amen. you. And these are the things that, you know, I need to remove from my everyday life. But yeah. Amen. Amen. Thank you for the testimony. And be careful even with pseudo-Christian things. Uh, I'm just saying because she didn't tell her what she was watching. Sometimes you might think that because it's a Christian movie, Jesus can sit there and watch with you. Let me explain this. Most of those Christian movies, they use exactly the same structure for the plot and the semiotics. Let me give you an example. Facing the Giants. And all those movies, they all start with the same plot. It's Brutus and Popeye. In the beginning, the guy is worldly, 
curses God, doesn't want to know about God, anything. Then in the last 15 minutes of the movie, 10 minutes of the movie, he goes through a conversion. And his life that was a mess, his marriage was a mess, his work was a mess. Now his company is successful. Everything is going fine because he is accepting Jesus. I want you to notice this. We are transformed by beholding, not by information. He had behold 90 minutes of sin from his worldly life and five minutes of a conversion that is fake, that is based in prosperity theory. When life doesn't get easy, gets worse. Satan will attack you even more. And now these guys, everything's going smooth. Company prospering. Look at this. The guy is praying in the locker rooms for the team that is going to enter the field and do... And still thinking that God is blessing the team. Are you with me? It's the same thing. Satan just thought, okay, I was able to bring movies to their homes. Now some of them don't watch this, so let me give them a good excuse. It's a conversion story. There's always something good in those movies, some moral lesson. You know, if you do research, there's a lot of good things in coffee. But they are not telling you about the bad stuff on it. Okay? So, even Christian movies, we use, we fell on the mistake, opening my heart like Lisa did, we fell on the mistake of letting our kids watching some cartoons that were Christian movies from Richard's, uh, what was the name? Yeah, this guy was a producer for Disney. That was by itself a red flag. But still, it was a Christian movie. I mean, we were feeling like, man, we are so restrict with the kids. I mean, there's something they need to watch. And Satan will always start with those little things. It takes 50 years to get you where he wants. So I remember one day I see my kids. They were still young. And they are playing there. And one goes, oh, yeah, you idiot. Are you this and that. Hey, wait, wait. I said, what is going on here? What did you say? And when he turned to me, I realized he was not even aware that he was doing anything wrong. He said, I said, idiot. I said, when did you learn that? He said, oh, in the Good Samaritan movie. Wait. I went to check the movie, and the two thieves that are going to rob the man, they movies they work a little bit with reality and the rest is fantasy and plot so they're talking and they always have names they always have this and that it's a fake story around it and i realize that my kids will only repeat the funny things they were saying and the funny lines but they were not really repeating the story they didn't know anything about the story so i'm like I'm not teaching them the bible in fact he's teaching a lot of mistakes you know that there's no place in the Bible that says that Paul fell off the horse. Just that we walk and we all have that idea. He fell, he fell. They could be walking. They you see, we create things in our mind that are not there. So I really, really encourage you if you have kids, there's only one thing I am sorry. It's not the things that I restrict from my kids. Is the little opening up here and there that I was doing concessions with. Now, of course, I did also another mistake, which was if you just tell them, don't do this, but you don't engage in other activities with them, I mean, there's so much they can resist to not doing what is bad. We need a microphone here, and we surely need to we surely need to finish now because Sister Terry asked me, will you go until 6? And I said, no. <laughs> she knew me better. And my wife said, don't listen to him. He will go until 6. Yeah. It was not my fault. It was your fault. Yeah, I have a granddaughter. She's under, just under 2. And um, she lives in, <clears throat> in Georgia. In the, okay, close to the microphone so they can hear Yes, it's otherwise people will not listen at home. Or speak, speak, it's okay. better verse. Speak Hi. loudly. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Use your preacher voice. Uh, okay. <laughs> Even if you put but, the microphone a little so bit. So I have this, uh, my granddaughter, she's a little under two. She's, you know, she'll be two next month. But um, she lives in Atlanta with her, do her mom. And I try to bring her out to the city to spend time with me, you know, so she can learn, you know, country living. And her mom, she, 
she let her watch, I don't know if you're familiar with this little show called Coco Melon. Uh, I mean, I don't know who know about it. But it's like a little moral show, sort of. You know, teaching them how to thank, you know, thank you, thank you, mom, thank you, dad. Kind of cute, you know, so it seems. But, I mean, I have not really done any research on Coco Melon, but I know who's behind all of this. So I just know that. So what I told my daughter, I say, sweetheart, okay, I understand that that is a little moral show for her. She's learning how to say thank you. She's learning colors and different cute things like that. I say, but that, that might have some morals in it. I say, but try, if you're going to let her be watching that much TV, try to get, get Bible songs, you know, where she'll be learning the Bible, because I know I learned from that, not from TV, but, you know, singing Bible songs, you learn the Bible when you're growing up. So when she's with me, I just blast her with Bible songs and, you know, let her just, and she's learning now. She's looking forward to it, you know, to see the, the Bible songs and hear the Bible songs. She's clapping and, and like, you know, making sounds, whatever. But I notice when I, um, at times I switch it back to the Coca Mel and she'd be like, ah, 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 screaming. Like, that's what she got, you know, that's what she, she's more familiar with. But I was going to ask you, like, if you're familiar with Coca Melon and what is, if, if there's anything you know behind that or anything like that. Well, I'm not familiar with that specific thing, but usually the concept that is used is the same. Look, I don't know if you know anybody that will fish just with the hook, with no worm. I don't know, because fish, fish usually don't like hooks. They like worms. So if you're like, nah. If you come with a worm, why don't you come with a, with a hook? They will not come. So Satan will always flourish and en embellish in a nice way the things he wants to hook us with. Yes. What I told is that you can, if you get her the Bible, if you give her the word in songs or whatever, she gets everything. She gets moral. She gets Yes. She gets I want us to understand the difference between moral and spiritual. Atheistic people, they are moral people. They believe that I should not steal from my neighbor. I should be honest in business. So moral is not spiritual. And usually they are learning. You know, I'm going to say something a little bit strong. For the people that are behind movements like lives uh, and black lives and all this kind of movement, in their mind they are defending moral values. What they are not noticing is that the moral values they are defending are in the basis, true concepts that were attached with wrong uh, ways of approaching it. You see? Because for me, it's mind-blowing. I, I, I saw a post the other day uh, that a, a girl was saying like this, please somebody explain this to me. If... Abortion is not killing a baby on the womb, then why when some man kills a pregnant woman is double homicide? There's no way you can answer. You see, this is a trap, a catch-22 on a moral issue. Moral, worldly movies are teaching our kids some wrong moral concepts. They will teach her everybody has the right to choose their sexual orientation. This is a moral principle. We should not have prejudice because people have a different sexual orientation than we do. This is a moral principle. And of course, they will not teach that in such an open way. A mind of a child is a virgin record. First, no child under the age of three should not be beholding any kind of screen. Okay, this will re delay their... Uh, cognitive process, especially with the speak, the learning of, of speech. So you will have a hard time because she's not under your care and for you to do this work, but try as much as you can to have her involved with other kind of activities and distracted from there. Kids are so easy to call attention, but when they get addicted to that, there's nothing you can do. So you have to bring them and engage them and give them little rewards, less and less as time progresses, that they have less of that. Of course, you work for a month. When she goes back, she goes back into that. 
but you can pray and ask the Lord. But I would be very careful. I will be very careful. Some people, when I finish this lecture, they ask me, so what can we do? And I said, yes, life has been very boring for 6,000 years. In the past, people wouldn't do anything. They would just sit and say, TV was not invented yet. I mean, we have survived 6,000 years. Have you stopped to think that in the last century, life has changed so much that the things we have, just look around you, the things we have in this room, for 6,000 years, nobody had. Still, they had time to do a lot of things that we are not able to do. They didn't have this. They didn't have that. They didn't have that. They didn't have that. Clothing was very different. Uh, this only part of the time. This they didn't have the way we have. I mean, you look around. We live in a total different world. How did they survive? So... I would say the less and less we are absorbing those things, the better for the final battles. Now, it's easier said than done, I admit it, but only with a lot of prayer. The final battle, it's a serious one, and Satan is not playing around it. If you are not serious about it, you will not make it. So you have to grab to Jesus. Let's close with a word of prayer. You have a last question? I know you'll be upset with me if I don't let you ask it's a statement? Okay, better. Yeah, it's not a question. I think sometimes the worst enemy of our children is the parents. Sometimes we want to pamper them and think they're lacking things that they really are not lacking. So I think as parents, we have to um, re-examine ourselves and our values, and that's what we're going to give our kids. That's a very good way to close, and that's very true. Sometimes our kids have an addiction to a screen, because we don't want to spend time with them. It's easier to have them entertained. And Satan is, is, I like this method. Okay? Okay. Now, my wife, I have to let her speak. Otherwise, you know. Okay. You had a wonderful way to close. <laughs> I just wanted to get the hook to what she said, which has to do with the song that we're going to share with you guys. The biggest problem that we face right now in Adventism is actually the brief heart of standing for what is true we know there is a minority but we feel pressed so we go with the majority we don't want to be the minority we don't want to be hated we know theoric theoretically that you know if you follow jesus you're going to be hated if you follow jesus you're going to be awkward you're going to be put it on the side we know but we don't want it so the biggest challenge and i think that this is what uh, the song is going to talk about so I think the biggest challenge is, do we really want Christianity? Because you know what? It's popular right now. When it will no longer be popular, will we still stand? Will we still do what we are supposed to do? Or the pressure is going to be too big? So it depends actually what we're doing now, whether you're going to stand later or not. We, we read Bible stories. Oh, Daniel. Oh, and the, the, the friends. You know, they could have faked up and just, you know, I'm going to tie my sandal. They didn't move. They, they didn't do anything. Are we willing to stand? Are we serious about this? We talk about it a lot while it's popular. Guys, it's coming a time that is no longer going to be popular. So these choices are hard to make now. It's going to be harder later. Okay, so we will close with this song. Please pay attention to the lyrics. It has to do with what Sarah was really mentioning. And then uh, we will have a final word of prayer. Thank you very much, all of you. I know it was a very intense day. You had to bury me for a long time. Uh, my last word to you will be, don't think just because you know it, you got it. Take it serious. Don't let it just go. And don't let these lectures from today be just in your memory as the nice day we spent together. Make decisions with the Lord, with His power, for a change.
Christians all around the world have known who they believe. They serve God and surrender all to serve Him faithfully. But they are those who water down the truth that they once preached about. How can we stand idly by? We must keep the standard high. Stand strong, stand firm. Represent the cross to all the world. Don't bend, don't break. Stand for what is true and choose to stay. God will never let you stand alone, so stand strong. Love is lucky for someone to stand for truth and right. One who go unto the lost and tell them of his life. Few have answered to his call, and fewer still have stayed. Christians, it is time to rise, the name of God proclaim. Stand strong, stand firm, represent the cross to all the world. Don't bend. Stand for what is true and choose to stay. God will never let you stand alone. So stand strong. Stand for those around you. Change what they believe. Stand while they may falter. The children of the King. Stand for Christ who called you to trust Him and obey. We must live for the high. Together we will stay. Stand strong, stand strong, stand firm. Represent. The cross to all the world. Don't bend, don't bend, don't break. Stand for what is true and choose to stay. God will never let you stand alone. No, God will never let you stand alone. No, no, God will never let you stand alone, so stand strong, stand strong. Let us pray together. Let us kneel before the Lord. Father in heaven, Help us to look back down in history and see that Christianity was never a popular thing. We have been mesmerized. We have been desensitized. We are spoiled by Satan with a life that is surrounded with easy things, with comfortable things, self-pleasing things, comfort food, comfort pleasure that are all self-centered. We are so addicted to those little rewards, rewards for things that are also self-centered. Father, we need to understand that all throughout history, it was just a minority who made it. It was not because they were stronger than others, but because they were standing strong in Jesus. Help us to run to you, to have you as our shelter, so that we will not be found without a shelter in the time of trouble. Help us to realize this is a serious, serious endeavor. 
This is the most serious thing we could be involved with because eternity is at stake. Help us to realize that on the flood, it was just a minority. Help us to realize that throughout the history of Israel, it was just a minority. When they left Egypt and came to the promised land, it was just a minority. In Babylon and in all the places and all throughout history, even in the disappointment that we had at the church, it was just a minority. And also help us realize, not proudfully, that we are the remnant church, but even among these remnant, only a minority will really be committed and thinking seriously. Help us to read over and over again the story of the ten virgins and understand that the other five was also sincere Adventists that also believed but were not watchful enough, didn't make decisions. Help us, Father, to go from understanding rationally to practicing in our daily lives. I pray and intercede for this church, its leadership, and for each one of us in our families, our couples, our children and youth. In Jesus' name, amen. More, thank you very much to the leadership of the church for receiving us and spending this time with you. I hope it was a blessing for you. I want to share that this contact was what I started preaching, and that's what God used to turn me into a pastor. It was all, it all started, but I never get tired of sharing with others about it. May the Lord bless you. I'll be at the door greeting you, especially because Michelle is there, and she might have some good cookies for me. <laughs> Okay, and so now we have some refreshments over in the fellowship hall. Those of you who are hungry, but I know most of us are still filled from lunch, but you're welcome to social, well, it's not Sabbath, it's not done yet, but remember the Sabbath and be temperate. Thank you for coming. God bless you.